70 witnesses to get through. So uh, a reminder to each witness, you will be given two minutes to testify. Uh, if somebody has already spoken on the points that you would like to speak on, remember we have your written testimony and feel free to use a simple me too. Uh, and for members, uh, please ask pointed questions. Uh, with that, we'll call the first bill. It is House Bill 901, Delegates Solomon and Chair Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And I'm just going to call up a couple members of our panel. Um, Delegates, uh, do you want me to bring in, typically we do virtual at the end, but I can bring in the Baroness. Uh, that would be given great. the circumstances. Yep. Yeah, thank so you. let's admit the Baroness. Um, and then Lauren Lamb, uh, Andrew. It's true, I'm not making this and up. Alex, if you want to come up. Huh? Are you going to go first? And then yep. Or do you want to go second? Um, and then the Baroness? Uh, yeah. Beba. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Vice Chair, we're going to, uh, so I guess uh, Delegate Solomon is going to speak, and I'm going to speak, and then we'll allow the, ba the Baroness to go afterwards. Okay. So we can present the bill before she begins to discuss. Roger. Did you tell she had two minutes? Yeah. Okay. Jason should have two. <laughs> um, well, thank you, uh, committee members. Um, and I just have to say it's been a, a real honor and a pleasure to work with, uh, with the chair on this bill. Um, I'm a little intimidating to have him sitting next to me. Um, but it, appreciate you all. Um, you all. <laughs> we heard that. <laughs> Uh, appreciate you all uh, the consideration of allowing us to present uh, House Bill 901, which would create the uh, Maryland Age Appropriate Design Code. And before I get into sort of the meat of the bill, um, I wanted to, to share some, some stats that I think highlight really the mental health crisis that, that we see. And as a, as a dad, as a former high school teacher, um, you know, and I hear this on a regular basis when I, talk to, um, when I talk to parents, when I talk to school groups, and I think we hear this literally in every corner of our state. Um, so this is a, a statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association. They joined together, uh, this was uh, in the fall of 2021, to declare a national state of emergency in children's mental health. Um, they say the challenges facing children and adolescents are so widespread that we call on policymakers at all levels of government and advocates for children and adolescents to join us in this declaration. And then this is a survey that, that Pew did um, just last month. Um, they surveyed about 4,000 parents across the country um, of all stripes, shapes, and sizes. 40% of the respondents said they were extremely or very worried about their children struggling with anxiety or depression. And another 36% said that they were somewhat worried. So that means three quarters of parents have fear that their children are dealing with depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders. Um, and they were just really incredibly sobering statistics released by the Centers for Disease Control uh, literally just, uh, just this month. 30% of girls had considered attempting suicide, which was double the rate among boys, and up almost 60% from a decade ago. Self-poisoning rates among 10 to 18-year-olds, which had declined um, leading up to the turn of the century, had increased substantially. Um, and data on hospitalization and suicidal ideation had also uh, increased really tremendously uh, over the last decade. So we're facing a crisis that was long before, um, long before the pandemic. And part of the reason that, that I decided to work on this bill was really how do we get to the root cause of some of these issues? And there's been a lot of documented evidence that the internet, social media, and the prevalence of, of online engagement is really a part of that. It's not a silver bullet, it's not going to solve everything, but it is a tremendous piece of it. And so we started to look at how we could go about what models have been on the books, have worked in other places to really get at addressing a lot of the harms that our young people are experiencing in the online space. And so we decided to embark on, on implementing the Maryland Age Appropriate Design Code. And we would join essentially a host of other, other uh, locales around, around the world. Um, you're going to hear from, uh, from Baroness Biban uh, Kidron, who uh, led the charge on this in the United Kingdom. Um, they have this on the books in the United Kingdom. And if you are a young person who uses the internet, you essentially have more rights and more protections than a young person in the state of Maryland or a young person in another part of the country. Um, California passed this law unanimously. It was bipartisan introduction, unanimous passage in a state that is probably home to more tech companies than any place in the United States. Passed this unanimously, and they are in the process of implementing it. Uh, and this uh, law has similarly been introduced in places around the country like New Mexico, Minnesota, um, New Jersey, a couple of other states that are a little further behind where we are. We're hoping, uh, we're hoping to be, be a leader here. 
Um, and this is something that's been raised at the federal level um, by members of Congress, frankly, from both parties. It's something that, that Congress is starting to pay more important attention to. The President talked about it uh, to a standing ovation in his, in his State of the Union. Um, but we know Washington takes a while to act. Um, and as you're going to hear from, from the Chair and from, from members of our panel and, and other witnesses today, we really we can't wait. We see, we, we see the statistics, we know the harms, and we can't wait. So for the purpose of this bill, a minor is considered anybody under the age of 18. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of, of what the actual nuts and bolts of the bill are. Um, so essentially, why this bill is so, is so important is it's about creating a, a framework and a design code. There are some prescriptive pieces in here where we lay out certain things that are non-negotiable uh, for protecting children in online spaces. But the bulk of the bill is around a framework of what it means to think about the harms that our, our children could potentially be exposed to um, and give tech companies who, frankly, employ some of the smartest people we know in the world the ability to innovate and really think about how they can make their platforms and their services fit in the context of keeping our children safe. So the bill outlines 15 standards that apply to digital products that are likely to be accessed by children. And that includes things like restricting data collection, uh, the sharing and profiling, and the use of data in a way that is detrimental to children. Um, some of the prescriptive pieces, it requires high privacy settings by default, switches off geolocation, um, and the prohibition of using what we call sort of dark patterns or nudge techniques uh, to convince a, a, a minor to disable uh, a privacy protection or, frankly, to stay on a platform longer than they really should. Um, it demands transparency and age-appropriate uh, terminology so that a young person can actually understand essentially what they're entering into um, when they use these platforms uh, and, and make sure that there's access to parental controls and a conversation uh, for young people to understand what those kind of parental controls are. Um, again, this, in, the, in the lack of sort of a prescriptive nature, the most important tool in this bill is it requires companies to create a data protection impact analysis. And again, it is about giving them the ability to innovate and to look at their products from a lens of what kind of harm is this doing potentially to, to children and how can we have the flexibility to do it. Um, the, other, the other piece in the bill that I want to make sure I, I touch on, well, it's really two pieces, because I think sometimes, and you may hear this from the opposition today, that this is really a, a gotcha bill. We're, we're out to get big bad tech. We're out to make it difficult for these companies to do business. That's not the case at all. So first of all, this bill has an exemption um, for small companies. If your revenue is below $25 million, uh, if you do not make money off of selling data um, of 50,000 accounts or more, you're exempted from this. So first and foremost, we don't want to impact, particularly we know our tech industry in the state of Maryland is growing. You're going to hear from, uh, from a tech entrepreneur shortly about what this, uh, why this is important. But we don't want to, we don't want to really put undue burden on, on small companies that are just getting started. And then most importantly, we include a provision, uh, a right to cure provision, um, which I know you, know, you you hear about all the time in this committee. But again, we're not out to get these companies. The provision that we have in this bill says that if, um, if the Attorney General chooses to bring a, a claim and the, the, uh, the measures uh, to enforce this are, are vested in the Attorney General and the Attorney General's staff, um, if they believe that you have uh, violated the spirit and the, and the intent of, the, of this law, there's a 90-day period for you to fix it. So it is meant to be a back and forth between the Attorney General's office and these companies to say, if you did not intend to harm a young person, if you, know, you designed a product and, and it's not doing what it was intended to do, let's fix it. Let's figure out what the problem is and make it better. Um, this is not about slapping huge fines on these companies. This is not about shutting anybody down. It's about preserving what is a tremendous space, frankly, online for our young people but for it to be there in a safe and, and secure and, frankly, healthy manner for them. Um, before I wrap up, I wanted to touch on some of the opposition arguments that, that you're going to hear today, because I think it's really important to sort of set the tone for that. Um, so first and foremost, you're going to hear that uh, there's a lawsuit currently pending in California um, with the California legislation in, in uh, California District Court. So we reached out to, uh, to our, our counsel, our attorney general, and the review that we got back, I just want to read um, one, one line. Uh, I have not found any clearly unconstitutional infirmities in HB 901 as introduced. So you're going to hear from our opposition that this bill shreds the Constitution. It shreds the First Amendment. That's not true. Um, so I wanted to make sure that, that that was on the record. Um, 
The other thing I, I wanted to touch on is um, I mentioned that small companies are exempted, um, and I mentioned that there's the right to cure, which is really important. You're also going to hear about a federal statute called the um, Children's Online Privacy and Protection Act, or COPA, as it's usually referred to. This is a law that's literally 25 years old, applies only to, uh, to people under the age of 13. Um, and frankly, I think any member of Congress or expert would tell you this law is dramatically out of date. I, I don't even think in the late 90s we could have ever fathomed what we would be dealing with in terms of technology and access to technology. I mean, the fact that you literally have every piece of information at your fingertips and access to the entire globe on a, on a device that you can carry around in your pocket was not something we were grappling with as policymakers um, 25 years ago. And so this law has been on the books. Um, we also asked the Attorney General to make sure that our bill was not running into conflicts with that. And again, I wanted to read, read this to you to make sure that it's on the record. To the extent COPA applies only to children under the age of 13 years, even if the federal law had preemptive effect with respect to children under 13, it would not have preemptive effect over the provisions of HB 901 as applied to teenagers between 13 and 18 as the bill extends to all children under the age of 18 years. So again, we did our homework. We made sure that we were on solid legal ground. Um, but you're going to hear that a, a lot from, from the opposition and then the opposition testimony that's been, been submitted. Um, the last piece that I, the last two pieces that I want to touch on that I think you're also going to hear from opposition are this, uh, this argument that this is going to require in some ways more of an invasion of privacy because we have to figure out what age the, the um, users of our platform really are. Well, in no way does this bill require age authentication. It says age estimation. Um, we know there's a lot of different ways that companies can essentially use what data they do collect on you to try to figure out an approximation of what your age. And we know it's not going to be perfect, right? We're not going to be able to, unless you are signing up for an account, um, you know, where you're putting your information in or you're paying, um, chances are it's an estimation. Um, but we want them to do the best estimation that they can, proportional to the harm that potentially the site could, could inflict. So if you're under the age of 18 trying to get on a, on a dating website, for example, um, that's going to require a very hard and fast age verification. But if you're, uh, you know, logging onto uh, a news website or something, that's entirely different. Um, and so I want to make that clear that we, again, leave room for innovation in here. And some of the terms are purposely vague um, because we want to make sure that we were not overly prescriptive because the Internet of six months or a year from now could be a very, very different place than the Internet of today. Um, and lastly, the, the only other point I want to make is this is not a content bill. This is not about restricting content. This is not about walling off the internet or firewalling things on the internet that we don't want our children to see. This is about making sure that our, our young people are not manipulated into seeing content that is not appropriate for that. So again, using the example of, of a news website, um, if you log on to the Washington Post or the Baltimore Sun and there's an article on the front page about some really ghastly topic, um, that's totally okay. We're not limiting content. We're not telling you what you can and cannot post. But if suddenly, because you've accessed that website, you are getting emailed day in and day out, or you are getting directed and manipulated to see really harmful content because they are taking your information, they are profiling you, they are using your information in a way that you did not necessarily consent to, that is what we were trying to get at. So you're going to hear a lot about, again, we're sort of shredding the First Amendment. It's not the case at all. Um, so I know I've gone on a little bit, but I, I think some of these, th these arguments are, are really technical, and I wanted to make sure we got a chance to to sort of uh, confront it from the get-go. Uh, I would urge a, a favorable report on, on House Bill 901, and again, really honored to, to be sitting next to the chair here. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and uh, colleagues. Uh, first, I want to say I'm very grateful to be here sitting in front of you today to present House Bill 901. And um, I say, you know, uh, the good delegate has said so much, so I would definitely try to be brief. Um, but the legal protections put into place by our industry years ago just didn't anticipate the growth of the internet and how it would develop, and that our online platforms have gone to be from being just mere publishers to actual unregulated necessities of everyday life. And our children have access to you know, products and services that we could never even imagine. I mean, I remember when they had the, the car phone. It was actually attached to your car in, in the bag phone. I remember growing up seeing Dick Tracy with a watch that he could actually use as a phone, and I never thought in a million years that would be real. And that's comical to go back and think of that. Or the fact that my, uh, my daughter's uh, Apple Watch is faster than the Apple IIe that I had in, in college and high school. Because that's how fast things are moving. And just as we wouldn't put our children in a vehicle without uh, brakes or lights, 
we need to understand that this technology needs to have some standards for consumer safety. We're just asking big, big tech to be thoughtful about its products that they put out and offer our children. What this bill does is establish a safeguard to protect our children when they're using online products and establishes standards that apply to all digital products and services that children are likely to access. We've, you know, as you heard, there's similar legislation elsewhere. And I will say this about the California lawsuit. As legislators, legislators we should never be let lawyers put us in fear to do the right thing. Our job is to do the right thing. We don't need to be scared of going to court about it, and we will defend ourselves accordingly. And I want to thank uh, Delegate Solomon for allowing me to be on this, you know, Bill, uh, because I'm a father, three daughters, and um, my children are not commodities. They're not fungible. They're very important to me. And I see my daughter, my 15-year-old, with her head buried in her phone every day, all day. And unfortunately, if you're a parent, you know as good of a parent as you are, and whatever restrictions you put on, you can't look over their shoulder all the time. And unfortunately, those of us who don't use our phones like that, we kind of just assumed it was doing the right thing anyway. It's only when you start digging deep or you grab your child's phone, do you see some of those things coming on or do you see the advertisements targeting at them? Or the fact that they can be direct messaged by grown men wanting to see pictures of their feet, that's a problem. We're not asking for anything ridiculous. We're not asking for anything onerous. We just want our children to be safe. And in this new technological era, technology must also be safe. Thank you. Go ahead, Noon. Uh, I think we'll go to the Baroness next. Madam Baroness, good to see you. Go ahead. Uh, you, can, you can brief when ready. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And if I can start my, my comments by just saying how moving I found it, hearing both of the previous speakers speak so eloquently, both about the problem and the solution. So... Uh, a very good afternoon, a good evening from where I am, Chair Wilson and committee members, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Baroness B. Bankidron. I'm a crossbench peer here in the UK, House of Lords, where I've been a member of the Communications Committee, the Online Safety Committee, uh, of Pre-Legislative Committee, and I'm also the founder of uh, Five Rights Foundation, which is an international NGO dedicated to building the digital world children and young people deserve. Put simply, the age-appropriate design code focuses on product safety at the point of design. It contains 15 standards that together create a thoughtful regime of child privacy by design, and it contains three elements that I'd like to bring your attention to because they represent a true paradigm shift in how tech is regulated. First, it defines children as a person under 18, doing away with the current online practice that has made 13 the age at which a child can be treated as an adult. It provides protection to children online where they actually spend their time by focusing on services likely to be accessed by children instead of the current federal standard of services directed at children. It requires high privacy protections by design and default meaning tech companies innovate to ensure product safety rather than trying to deal with issues after harm has been experienced by children. HB 901's approach is based on product safety because this is an international model that we know produces results and has long been part of our business culture. HB 901 requires businesses offering online products to undertake a risk assessment to identify foreseeable risks of harm to children arising from their data management practices, and then mitigate or eliminate that risk before the product is available to children. We know this model works. Since the AADC came into force here in the UK, we've seen a wave of changes to the design of tech products, each of which have improved the lived experience of children and teens. Instagram now prevents adults from messaging children they do not know. They've turned off location tracking by default and introduced prompts that encourage children to take breaks from scrolling. Google has made safe search the default browsing mode for children and turned off YouTube's autoplay function. TikTok has recently made accounts for those under 16, private by default, and stop sending notifications for all users 16 and under after 9 p.m. These are just three of hundreds and hundreds of modifications, each of which make children and young people incrementally safer by design. 
I really do want to thank all Maryland colleagues for their warm welcome a few weeks ago and thank the sponsors, this committee and the state of Maryland for considering these important design protection changes for children and young people online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to leave you in here. Just if you could go on mute when we'll have questions, you'll be here to help us out. And then we'll go to the next uh, panel witness. And we have three more before we take that. Thank you to the committee for having me here today. I'm Lauren Lamb. I am a former high school teacher, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland State Education Association in strong support of House Bill 901. Online platforms, and especially social media platforms, are increasingly major parts of all of our lives, and especially for children. As educators, we know the importance of meeting students where they're at and evaluating what is most appropriate to help them learn and thrive. Unfortunately, we know that online platforms and social media companies are not always doing the same. Children and adolescents today are dealing with a lot, from the lingering effects of the pandemic, to pervasive social injustice, to bullying and harassment that now, due to online platforms, can reach them 24-7. By nearly every measure, students are suffering from increased rates of anxiety and depression at younger and younger ages, and it's hitting girls and LGBTQ students especially hard. Educators at nearly every grade band have stories of how social media platforms have been used to bully other students or promote dangerous pranks. Factors like these make learning harder, and it's causing undue stress for our future generations. Although online platforms have benefits, including for learning, students should not have to deal with the deluge of targeted advertising and harmful messaging that online platforms can facilitate. For that reason, the Maryland State Education Association supports House Bill 901, and we encourage you to follow the example of other states and countries that have required social media companies to put age-appropriate policies and guardrails in place to protect growing minds. Thank you. Chairman Wilson and committee members, firstly, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Alex Miles. I'm the founder and CEO of a tech startup called Breakthrough. We're proudly headquartered here in Baltimore. Our platform, our platform matches high school and college students to scholarships, educational resources, capital, and career opportunities that can boost their likelihood of success in life. So far, 80,000 students have downloaded our app. 60% identify as girls and women, and 75% coming from underserved communities. When we built our platform, we consciously asked young people what they wanted to see from it. They were very clear to us. They didn't want another vanity-driven app based on likes that create more anxiety in their lives. They wanted opportunity, an equitable opportunity, and were willing to share their data to do so. We took their feedback seriously and have implemented strong protections for what we do with their data. Every user has to accept our data use practices, which we follow California's privacy policies, before they start using the app. In addition, when they use a feature for the first time which shares their data, we provide them a warning. Our company is currently valued at $12 million through some investment last year. And if we wanted to sell our users' data, it could probably be two to three times that much. By profiting off the sale of their personal data and exploiting them is not the right thing to do. For our industry, we build the trust of young people we need to be transparent and honest with them. We owe them a duty of care. That's why I'm here today, to urge you to support the Maryland Age Appropriate Design Code. In the UK, where a similar law has been in place since September 2021, tech companies are already complying and it's already making a difference in the experience of young people online. Don't Maryland youth deserve the same types of protections? I certainly believe so. And that's why I urge you I urge your support for this essential legislation. Thank you. All right, there we're good. All right, sounds good. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Lear. I'm a high school sophomore from Calvert County, and I'm the Maryland Association of Student Council's Mental Health Affairs Coordinator, and I join you today in favor of House Bill 901. I've submitted, submitted my written testimony to the committee, which talks about a deeper and ongoing personal experience I've had from the detriments of social media. I'd like to talk to you all today about those sweeping impacts that social media has on myself and all my generation at large, and urge that this bill be passed to take steps to improve our lives on and offline. 
Like many other kids in my high school and in my generation, we already deal with so many pressures, including how we view ourselves and what's going on around us. In a very formidable time in our lives, our mental health is directly tied to something that we have very little control over right now, the lives we lead online. How we show up and how people interpret everything about, everything about us, like our appearances, our relationships, is directly and inextricably impacted by the ways that social media platforms manipulate our data and influence what we see. I already deal with a whirlwind of challenges as I navigate high school and try to build up my confidence while people judge my appearance and my voice, and I already feel discontent due to the congenital deformities in my right hand, making me more scared of a handshake than public speaking. I've been in deeply dark places in my life, and a lot of, a lot of that could have been prevented by several elements of this bill that I ask you to consider today. As a young man, people don't talk about how we deal with the same body image issues as girls do, and the anxieties that my generation feels, no matter their gender, are magnified online by the targeted ads we received and the videos that automatically play based on the data that social media and online platforms have collected about us. This bill, if introduced a year ago, would have allowed me to have higher privacy settings by default would have prevented hateful content from constantly showing up on my feeds and would have enforced the social media platform standards that are meant to protect me from social media fe features that have been deeply exacerbated exasperated, oh my goodness, sorry, what I already <laughs> experienced online. I could have been able to smile one more minute instead of being left to wonder if life was even worth living. I nor should any other student be given that burden, and this is why this bill is necessary. Good job, young man. All right, uh, seeing no one who wants to go to judiciary, uh, no questions. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, we got one. All right. It's Thank all, you. Judiciary's Thank on the first sure. floor. Now, this is actually... <laughs> Delegate Charcutian. This is a question for, for the chairman, actually. Did you want us to believe that you had an Apple phone when you were in high school or college? Is that what you were suggesting? No, an Apple IIe is a computer. Oh, it's okay. an old okay. computer oh, okay. desktop. Okay. I'm not yeah, as old as you, so I didn't clearly, know the reference, but I just correct. wanted to clarify. No, it is a very big old computer. <laughs> Thank all you, right. Mr. Chair. You boomers can get together after this. <laughs> All right, that concludes uh, this panel. Uh, and next up, we will have Marissa Shea, um, Christy McComas, Dalia Hashad, and that's it. Do I need to unmute myself? Nope, you're good. Okay. Just go ahead and start when ready. Good afternoon. Thank you for hearing me today. My name is Christine McComas, and I'm a lifelong Marylander along with my husband, and I raised four daughters. Maryland's anti-cyberbullying criminal statute is named for our daughter, Grace. Grace's sisters are now all strong, independent, and successful adults, but our beloved Grace Catherine is forever 15 having died by suicide related to death-wishing and hate-filled cyber abuse over social media. Grace never had a smartphone, and she wasn't even on Twitter, but didn't need to be to hear about and later see the things that were being said. I hope you'll take the time to read through my longer testimony and the malicious abuse aimed at children. Grace's law passed unanimously in 2013, less than one year after her death, and in 2019, Grace's Law 2.0 was passed to cover the ever-changing digital dangers, including sextortion, suicide baiting, and more. Over the past decade, I've come to know parents with tragic stories from around the world, but regularly hear from Maryland parents that are struggling to protect their own children. Right now, even the best, most engaged parents are unable to keep their kids safe online. Big tech's products are not designed with kids' safety in mind, and they aren't interested in regulating themselves. Instead, they have monetized our children online. 
Secret until recently, algorithms are push feeding dangerous and psychologically damaging content towards our kids, while platforms are designed to keep them and us online longer, driving up profits with little care for the collateral damage. Joined by other grieving moms, I visited Capitol Hill last fall, trying to get long overdue federal regulations passed. But big tech companies with their big pockets are powerful opponents, not working as allies to fix deadly problems, but instead fear-mongering falsely about constitutionality. This legislation is desperately needed and there is no time to wait. Maryland does, families deserve these protections now. Good afternoon, Chairman Wilson, Vice Chair Crosby, and members of the Economic Matters Committee. Thank you for having me here today. I'm Dahlia Hashad on behalf of Parents Together and millions of parents everywhere, delivering a letter signed by 250 Maryland parents in strong support of House Bill 901. I am here because we are desperate. As parents, coming here to ask for regulation was not our first stop. We have been to the big tech companies again and again to say our children are getting hurt, our children are even dying, and we have been ignored because they are making money by neglecting our children, by failing to design the products for our children's safety. I brought this picture of this amazing mother, Tawana Anderson, who lost her 10-year-old daughter, Nyla, Behind her are two women who lost their children years earlier to the exact same deadly challenge on the internet. And do you know what these women do every day? They go online and they find on these platforms the same deadly challenges and they flag them for the platforms. And they say, this killed my child, take it down. And the platforms say, this doesn't violate our terms of service. After their children died, after they had reported hundreds of similar videos and warned, Taiwana lost her daughter, Nyla, her 10-year-old, and buried her on Christmas Day. Children will continue to die. What does it take? Social media platforms are responsible in 2.6 minutes, TikTok recommends suicide contents to teen accounts, research from ISD. For a child to log off Instagram, it takes five clicks, but they can connect with a drug dealer in two clicks. And I know I'm at time, but can I tell you please, because you're gonna hear something different. Parents will move heaven and earth to protect our children, but we can't do it if we don't have the regulation. It is not us that can stop the big tech companies. It's you with that power right here. This is the regulation kids need and that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for your story. Uh, and it does mean a lot that you come up here and testify. Um, so thank you. Seeing no questions, that concludes this panel. I'm gonna do something a little bit different than usual. I'm gonna bring in the one uh, favorable virtual witness um, and then we will move to unfavorable. Uh, so I will call Anju Priyardishini, and go ahead re when ready, ma'am. Yes. Good morning, Chairman Wilson, Wilson and the members of the committee. I'm Dr. Anju Muninarayana. I'm a physician with a decade of experience working with adolescents, women, and families in India and the U.S. I'm doing my master's in the public health at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School. But most importantly, I'm a mom of two kids. I have an eight-year-old and a two-year-old. I'm here today in strong support of the Maryland age-appropriate design code bill. A recent study says that 97% of adolescents aged between 13 to 17 years old in the US use social media. Well, that may not, that's like every single teenager in the country. And this may not surprise many of you, but if you look at it another way, 97% of the kids in the US go to school. And I hope that 97% of the kids go to a doctor. And I'm sure that 97% of the kids go get a haircut done. And every single one of these places have protocol. They have rules. And every one, single one of these places are protected. They're safe spaces. Then why are we not doing this to protect our kids online? We, are, we as parents, we worry about how exposure to technology 
might affect our kids developmentally. We know that our kids are picking up social and cognitive skills at a stunning pace, and we don't want them hours glued, spent on an iPad. My daughter is almost always on Roblox, and it's an online game. And she's nine years old. And what I realize is that her interaction as a nine-year-old is much more intense and intimate than my son, who is a three-year-old, playing with his dad's phone and how the social media affects them, right? I mean, in fact, as a physician that I've seen how social media and text messages have become such an integral part of the teenage life that it's causing them anxiety, low self-esteem, body image issues, and suicidal ideations even. So as a medical community member, I believe that the Maryland age-appropriate design code bill will keep our children safe and protect our island online privacy. I'm thrilled to mention that Maryland Public Association supports the bill. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Seeing no questions, that concludes the favorable panel. Uh, we have one favorable in person, so I'm going to call Kaylee Locklear. And before we get to questions for the unfavorable, uh, to make it, I guess, more fair, I will then go through all the virtual witnesses, uh, and then we can take questions. So, Kaylee, you can come up and start. Mr. Chairman, I'm supposed to be signed up as a... You are. This is on favor. Okay. All Correct. Right. Might have heard that wrong. My apologies, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, honorable members of the Economic Matters Committee for the record, Kaylee Locklear here on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association and Respectful Opposition. And I first want to say that we do respect the intent of this bill. We value our consumers and their children's privacy, but we do have multiple concerns I'd like to share. So one of the biggest questions that we have is found on page 6, line 23, um, which is whether we're even included in this bill or not, because it says an online product does not include delivery or use of the product. So on retail websites, we have many children's items that would meet criteria in other areas of the bill because our products have elements children are interested in. But our sites serve individuals with the means to pay for goods who then have them delivered for use. Our websites are not designed to be accessed by small children, especially because they cannot read or purchase our goods. And that brings me to the next point and problem with the bill, which is it treats all children under 18 the same, as it says, quote unquote, it's likely to be accessed by children. Because many general audience sites, like online retail websites, could be found in scope, an enormous number of adults on sites would have to be treated as children. And I know the Federal uh, Children Online Privacy Protection Act was mentioned earlier. I would just add that um, our understanding is it is being taken up by Congress this summer and they are adding quite a few additional protections I think that you're interested in here. And you know, as I'm thinking of the best analogy that I could bring to this committee, it would be comparing this to our physical stores. If the goal is to place, say, an age checker for someone, we don't know their age, to buy, say, a Furby, um, before they go into our store, it means that we would actually have to collect even more data um, from that unknown individual, and that's where the problem presents itself. So with these comments, um, I'm glad to answer any questions. Okay, first we'll go to Claire Park. Hi, sorry, just confirming. Um, Great. Good afternoon, Chair Wilson and Vice Chair Crosby, members of Maryland's Economic Matters Committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Claire Park. I serve as External Affairs Manager for the Chamber of Progress, which is a tech industry coalition committed to ensuring that all Americans benefit from techno technological leaps. Um, our partners include companies like Amazon, Apple, and Google, but we don't represent them, and they don't have a veto um, over our positions. I'm here today to recommend against this bill in question, which could counterproductively put children at risk and disrupt the online experiences of all users, including adults. Though well-intentioned, the bill risks eroding access to critical online resources and privacy for everyone online. We absolutely agree that protecting young people online is an important goal, and in recent years, many platforms have heard the concerns from parents and researchers and implemented new features to protect younger users. However, we urge you to steer away from adopting this particular piece of legislation with two key principles in mind. First, 
the legislatures should avoid making platforms the arbiters of age-appropriate content for minor users. The bill requires that covered platforms act in the best interests of child users and reduce their risk of encountering potentially harmful content. But without providing clear guidance about what that entails, this means that every site would effectively be the arbiter of appropriate content for every minor user. This could mean that covered entities take a broad view of content considered harmful and remove swaths of content that might be valuable to some minor users to avoid liability. Covered platforms, for instance, could be forced to block older teenagers from accessing developmentally appropriate information simply because it would be inappropriate for much younger children. Second, requiring platforms to deploy age verification tools could indeed sacrifice all users' privacy in the name of increased security. Covered platforms would be forced to collect even more sensitive data of everyone online for the sake of verifying age-related information. This could include demanding ID documents or even facial recognition from all users. In summary, we urge you to avoid the mistakes made by prioritizing the needs of marginalized teens and avoiding age verification requirements that would sacrifice all users' privacy. Thank you so much for your time. Cara Bender, Bonder. Go ahead when ready, ma'am. Great, thank you. My name is Kara Boonder. I'm State Policy Director at the Computer and Communications Industry Association. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. CCIA is an international not-for-profit trade association representing a broad cross-section of communications and technology firms. CCIA strongly believes children deserve an enhanced level of security and privacy online. CCIA members have been leading the effort in raising the standard for safety and privacy across by creating new features, settings, parental tools and protections. However, as drafted, we respectfully oppose HB 901. CCIA is concerned about the bill's lack of narrowly tailored definitions. We further detail these concerns in our written comments, but at a high level, we are concerned that while the bill acknowledges that different age groups warrant different treatment, defining a child as an anyone under 18 does not provide for nuanced approaches to the different developmental levels of, of say a 14 year old or a 17 year old. Similarly, the definition of likely to be accessed by children is also ambiguous and in a similar vein, Clear language suited to the age of children likely to access online services is also not defined and leaves room for significant subjective interpretation. CCIA suggests clarifying how businesses are expected to assure the age of users online. Without a proper mechanism in place, it is difficult for businesses to discern the age of every individual user, which could lead to unintended violations. It is also unclear what mechanisms will be in place, put in place to address users who are intentionally misleading about their age. And CCIA is concerned that businesses can be forced to collect age verification data, which would paradoxically force companies to collect a higher volume of data on children. When business servers are required to deny, deny access to different social networking sites or other online resources, this may also unintentionally restrict children's ability to access and connect with like-minded individuals and community. For example, children of racial or other minority groups may not live in an area where they can easily connect with others that represent and relate to their own unique experiences, and an online central meeting place where kids can share their experiences and find support can have positive impacts. Finally, similar legislation signed into law in California has been challenged. Oh. Lawmakers pause on legislating while this issue plays out in the courts. Again, thank you for your time today. While we appreciate the intent of this bill, we respectfully uh, oppose this, this language. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret Durkin. Good afternoon, Chair Wilson, Vice Chair Crosby, and members of the committee. My name is Margaret Durkin, and I serve as Executive Director for TechNet in the Mid-Atlantic. TechNet is a technology trade association, and we appreciate the opportunity to speak today on House Bill 901. TechNet and its member companies are committed to providing a safe, age-appropriate experience for young people online. However, we have several concerns with the bill, as outlined in my written remarks. First, the terms within the bill are very vague, which would allow for broad interpretation. We're also concerned about the provision in the bill that calls on companies to decide what is in the best interest of children. We believe that parents and guardians should have the ultimate authority over what is in the best interests of children. In addition to the restrictions placed on websites, this could potentially put teens who don't share the same ideas with their parents in a tough situation. For example, if one was in a situation involving domestic violence or wanted to seek out reproductive rights. Age verification is also an issue and goes against many companies' data minimization practices where that encourages the less data the, 
as possible to be collected. And finally, we would say that the best way to keep young people safe online is through education and digital citizenship education to be specific. Some of our members are a part of the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, which outlines best practices for safe experiences online. And in addition to digital citizenship education, TechNet would also encourage a focus on an omnibus privacy solution, which in itself always covers children's protection online in addition to adults. So again, thank you for your time on this important issue and for the reasons stated above, TechNet is opposed to House Bill 901. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Charcutian. Hold on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, the question was to TechNet. I, she, can we get her? Thank you. I, if I heard your... I'm a little confused about your testimony, but the one part that I heard you say is parents and guardians should decide what's in the best interest of the children. And I, did you get a chance to hear the testimony that we had earlier from parents who are desperately trying to protect their children and couldn't and aren't able to because um, the structures that are in place and even when they communicate with the, the various uh, social media companies, they don't get the response that they need. So I'm just wondering, without this bill or a bill that's very similar to this bill, how exactly do you suggest that parents um, act in the best interest and to protect their children? Sure. So I was able to hear the testimony of the previous panels. And again, at this time, I can get back to the committee on that. But ultimately, TechNet feels that really in any situation that a family or a parent of these children should have the ultimate say. And unfortunately, putting that on companies is is tough to do as no system is infallible, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I agree that no system is infallible, but it does seem that each time that there's a possible way to protect children, um, the tech companies come and say, this isn't the way. And so we end up with no way. And so I'm just wondering if you you know, can provide what the structure is that would actually protect children, because we can't just keep year after year saying, because the one that's in front of us is in, it's not infallible, then we're not going to pass anything. I can check with members, our members on that structure and get back to the committee for you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. Uh, let me start by saying thank you to uh, Delegate Solomon for bringing this bill forward since I didn't get a chance to do that during your panel uh, and to the folks who spoke favorably as well. Uh, you know, when I'm not here in the General Assembly, my full-time job is to focus on data privacy on the federal level um, and making sure that we're actually increasing the age to 18 on COPPA and a whole bunch of other things as well. Uh, so this is uh, something that I've gotten passionate about over the last two years. Uh, and the, my question is to the retailers. Uh, the, the first baseline question I have is, what members exactly are concerned about this bill in terms of your Maryland members? Um, so uh, it would be every single operator found in every county that meets the initial threshold, the monetary threshold of the bill, because it's not by state. It's just a monetary threshold. Right. That's how we get captured under it. You talked about creating more data, right, as, as we're trying to figure out who's 18 and who's not. Uh, who's under the age of 18 specifically, you're saying you're creating more data. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about the remedies, because I think it's real that we need a solution here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are, are your members arguing that we need opt-in, right? Are we saying that we actually want to go to a more stricter policy in terms of making sure that everybody opts in, uh, right? Are we going to a, a policy shape where uh, delete actually means delete, where folks can actually delete their data both on the user side and the consumer side? I'm curious as to what you believe uh, you, and you may not have an answer, right? That may be a really wonky question that I'm asking. Uh, but this is such a serious topic, and it's hurting so many families. I'm curious what policy standpoint do you guys actually agree with in this current space? So I'm glad to follow up with you on this. We did have a little bit of this conversation, I believe, on HB 33, and then the bills that were heard the other day, and we did have conversations about opt-in and opt-out policies. We also are still just a little confused whether we're supposed to be captured in this bill or not, which is kind of adding to this. I'm hearing all these other conversations, and we don't fall into the same realm, I would say, as what's happening with these tech companies. We absolutely have products that are attractive to children um, that could be accessed. Right. 
Um, but at the same time, for us to differentiate or figure out the age of the individual who comes onto our website who's looking at that, I mean, for the most part, that's for somebody who has a credit card that can pay. I mean, maybe a child clicks on something and finds, I know I used an example of a Furby dating myself, but I, you know where I'm going with that, though. It's attractive to the child, but in no way then are we manipulating data or using um, some of the other things that are mentioned in this bill. It's because we're trying to serve legitimately consumers, which would likely be the adult buying the product for the child. So right. I can circle back around on the opt-in issues. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I would appreciate that because it, sure. it sounds like what you're saying is that your members are actually in favor in terms of making sure that the onus isn't on them as, as, as companies uh, to have all this data, which, which sounds like you're arguing for a more stricter policy than what we're introducing today, which is totally fine, and I'm happy to actually go in that direction. But I, I just want to have that conversation as we talk about this. I'm bill. glad to. I don't think it's stricter policy. I think one of our concerns, especially in light of the other two bills that were heard in this committee the other day, is we don't want to have to collect more data and be responsible for more data. We're just not sure how we would verify the age of somebody coming onto the website for a product that's attractive to a child. I mean, that's a very legitimate concern. I, I don't know how we would figure that out. Well, well, yeah. If someone's it, Christmas it, shopping, for instance, or Hanukkah shopping, right. and you're on a website searching for children's products, I mean, it would be easy to assume that could be a child or an adult, or, I mean, we don't know, we don't have information on that person. I mean, it's, it, it would be in theory, and again, I'm not going to waste too much time here, but in theory, it would be as simple as no different than when you go buy uh, alcohol or go to a, a website, uh, you have to punch in your date of birth, right? And that data continues to keep with you across the websites that you go to. Sure. Your, your, your members are currently doing that now. So in theory, it, it is possible. I, but I do want to just say, let's have a conversation offline okay. because I think, I think sure. it sounds like you're, uh, you're arguing for something that's more strict, which I'm happy to pursue. Glad to talk to you about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> a question for the retailers, and maybe this question would be better directed at the um, sponsors of the bill, but no offense to Delegate Clippinger. I have no desire to go to judiciary. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to follow. <laughs> I won't exile. Um, so you pointed out some of the, I think, inconsistencies in the bill, and I think some of the testimony I heard very moving. I think, yeah, we definitely need to protect children from being harmed on the internet. But Absolutely. some of the stuff I read in the bill, um, and some of the stuff that's identified as sensitive personal information, one of those is union membership status. Is that really an issue? Uh, in your experience with uh, children? I'm not the person to answer that, so I don't really have a response for that. I think the union okay. would be more appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess this, this question is more for the virtual witness, Ms. Durkin. Is she still around? Hi, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, I, I know in your in your written testimony you talked about um, how these standards or enforcement are deeply concerning as there is little guidance, few opportunities to fix mistakes, it contains an aggressive pro approach to fines and penalties. But the testimony of the bill sponsor suggested that he was trying uh, in crafting the bill trying to find a way to work with industry and that there were opportunities to fix mistakes and there was periods of time grace periods to fix um, or address any mistakes. So there wouldn't be any penalties during those grace periods as long as the industry or the particular person, uh, company was actually working to address those mistakes. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, what you're referring to in that statement. Sure. So overall, the, the terms in the bill are so vague that our companies are concerned that they wouldn't really, as I mentioned before, systems are infallible. Some systems, no system is infallible, rather, that they would be concerned about how to really enforce it on the front end. And so that's why we call, we mentioned in our testimony that the bill offers little guidance. Okay, I, I would, um, I guess without sounding too frustrated because I had a, a different bill, but a bill dealing with social media and data collection as well. 
and it, it, it just seems like the standard operating procedure for the industry is say we don't know how to do that. And I don't understand why the industry isn't with bill sponsors earlier on. I don't know why the industry isn't trying to figure out how to address these issues in a proactive way, as opposed to constantly coming and throwing their hands up and saying, we can't do this or we don't want to do this. We appreciate everything, but there are kids um, that are dying and kids that are committing suicide on a very regular basis to the point where we, we've basically become numb to it. I haven't become numb to it, and I'm sure the parents that were here today haven't become numb to it. And so I am, I guess I'm just very frustrated that the industry is here yet one more time, well, this doesn't work for us as opposed to how to make it work. And I, I would strongly encourage the industry to stop talking about how not to do it and how to grab all these kids' data so that you can mine them and figure out how to sell to them later on in life and start figuring out how to protect them. It is extraordinarily frustrating to hear the same old thing time after time. Thank you. So I don't see any other questions. So quick comment. Um, no, you're, you're good, Delegate. Uh, and then I have a question for Ms. Bender. Um, but the bill applies to businesses that have annual gross revenues of $25 million or more or annually buy, sells, <laughs> receives, or uh, sells or shares the personal information of 50,000 or more uh, consumers, households, devices, et cetera. So page four, I think, um, you know, the top of page four pretty much lines out um, or put some guardrails um, around what the earlier discussion was, I think, with uh, questions that were posed to you, Ms. Locklear. Going to Ms. Bender. Uh, is she still in? Okay. So you had mentioned age verification, and I just want to know where in the bill you find that. Sure, I can, I can clarify my comments from earlier and I appreciate the question. I, I did indicate that there needs to be more clarity about how to accomplish the age assurance. And from our reading of it, that would, that would you know, to avoid the liability that's associated for non-compliance with this, there would be some, you know, way of needing to verify who is indeed accessing the website. And I believe that was echoed from when the, the representative from the Retailers Association was, was talking about how do you know if somebody who is accessing a site, what their, what their age in fact is. And I believe my comments also addressed where the type of liability falls if, for instances where people are in fact lying about their age. Um, so ju it's just getting at that, the, the question of what is the, the reasonable way to be certain of, of the age of well, the user accessing it, it. In fairness to the bill sponsors, I mean, they add in age estimation um, sure. first. Second, um, you know, it really doesn't apply to you if you're not posting anything risky from the outset. So if you don't have anything risky up there, you really don't have to be concerned with the age estimation portion of it. Additionally, there's 90 days to cure with the Office of Attorney General, uh, and I think that that is a pretty reasonable step as well. So... Uh, the last comment I'll make is anytime anybody, you know, signs up for Facebook, and we had a couple of privacy bills before, and I remember uh, a, a fellow member from a different committee asked the question uh, and really actually pointed out the fact that when you sign up for Facebook, the first thing it asks you is your age. So it's not as if this can't be incorporated. All right. Uh, seeing no further questions, uh, that concludes this bill hearing. Next, we will go to Delegate McComas, House Bill 1082. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and esteemed committee. Um, this is my first bill hearing for this session, and um, I want, just want everybody to know that I am no longer a member of the House Judiciary Committee. After 20 years, I thought I should try appropriations, so just, just to let you know. All right. <laughs> um, HB 1082, commercial law, protection of minors from unfiltered tablets or smartphones. Using mobile devices such as smartphones and tablets, younger and younger children are access accessing internet pornography. The average age of first exposure is 11 years old, with children under the age of 10 accounting for 22% of, of online porn consumption of those under the age of 18. 
Children in the U.S. with a significant problem with pornography completed an online survey which showed 87% were males and 13% were females. Of these, 75% were exposed to porn between the ages of 9 and 13. Internet pornography, often violent in content, has become sex education for many children. Such a sex educator is indeed dangerous as children accept, learn from, and may emulate the behaviors portrayed as normative, attractive, and without risk. Children are accessing pornography effectively as easy as the click of a button on a device that fits in a pocket or a backpack. With only about 16% of the parents using filters or parental controls on such devices, the explosion of pornography across our culture is causing significant harm to developing minds of our youth. In 2014, the Journal of American Medical Association Psychiatry reported that pornography consumption is associated with decreased brain volume. In 2016, Psychology Today article by Dr. Philip Zimbardo from Stanford University asserted that if we continue to deny that porn can be a problem, we are effectively denying teens and preteens, many of them under age, help and guidance. Neurosurgeon Dr. Donald J. Helton Jr. published in the Journal of Psychoaffective Neurosciences and Psychology that addiction is a risk for children and youth who are who continually access pornographic materials, an extension of reward-based learning that can physically alter the brain and affect behavior later. The Journal of Violence Against Women reported in 2010 that the so-called soft porn has been replaced by graphic, extreme, and degrading content that is not only damaging young brains, but skewing perceptions as what is normal. The article asserted that images portraying physical and verbal aggression were directed towards women and girls 94.4% of the time. The business model of the pornography industry has changed with the majority of porn sites offering free access. In 2016, users, many of them children, watched 23 billion videos on free sites online in one year, translating to 4.6 billion hours of porn watched without filtered content to protect, to protect children. The use of filters by parents has been ineffective, as many parents who install parental control software, four out of five never actually turn it on. In 2002, the Supreme Court agreed that protecting minors from certain internet content must be done with the least restrictive means available. The court went on to promulgate that given the rapid evolution of technology of the internet, alternatives should be sought upon consideration of the relative restrictiveness and effectiveness of alternatives. HB 1082 represents a least restrictive approach which allow, allows parents to opt out of the protection if they so choose. Time is of the essence, protect our most valuable legacy to the future, support HB 1082. The whole point of the bill is, is that when you get a, a, a cell phone and you wanna give it to your child, you have, you have to opt in for the pornography. It automatically has a filter put on it that opts you out of that. And um, basically, this bill has been passed in Utah. Now, I realize Utah's maybe a more stodgy conservative state than Maryland. But the point is, is that they have, they're protecting their children. So that's why, and this bill was brought to me by the Maryland Coalition Against Pornography, Inc. And when you think about all these little kids are seeing adult behavior that is, you know, it might pass the obscenity test, but not for kids. Um, th this is not good for these children. Um, their little brains aren't formed until, you know, 25 or 26. And I mean, we, we've heard this constantly. And um, why we're allowing our children to be exposed to this is like incredible. So what the bill does, the bill has lots of definitions and certainly the bill is in your committee for you to, you know, kill it, chop it up, um, modify it, whatever. I think that we, we need to start. And I think the fact that um, I, I was there in the Judiciary Committee when we had uh, the little girl, uh, Grace McComas, um, the first version and the 2.0. And it's a very sad situation. And this, these parents are never going to get over that situation. And um, 
also the other lady that talked about the, the child being buried on Christmas Day. Um, we got to protect the kids. I mean, that's what our job is. And so I really hope that you all consider this. And um, please, uh, please, please, uh, we need to do something. And this is just, this is kind of a simpler fix maybe than the first bill hearing, but we got we to gotta do this. And I think to have to opt in is, 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 is better because it's a conscious decision by the parent. And most parents do not really understand how to run all this stuff. I don't understand how to run it. And um, so, I mean, you know, I'm kind of computer illiterate. Um, but I think parents are, are so inundated with so many responsibilities that let's make it easy on them. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. And um, I don't know if I have a panel or not. Uh, hopefully we, we submitted a lot of uh, written testimony, which I think you'll find interesting if you've got time. And like most of us, time is very precious. But, but anyway, thank you very much. There are a bunch uh, submitted, written. You also have uh, a whole bunch of people virtually, which we'll take out at the end. So uh, is that it, Delia? That, that's it for okay. in person. OK. Thank, well, thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Uh, next, we'll go to the unfavorable in-person, Kaylee Locklear. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair and honorable members of the Economic Matters Committee. For the record, Kaylee Locklear here on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association in opposition to this legislation. Again, I want to start by saying we believe this bill is well intended. Um, again, we support protecting children. We believe it's the intent of this bill actually to just capture manufacturers, but there are some implications for retailers and consumers we'd like to draw your attention to. This bill does create logistical challenges for our members. Warehouses often contain product that is delivered and sold in multiple states. If this bill were to become law, retailers would have to dedicate portions of their warehouses for products then that could only be sold in Maryland and not in other markets. Moreover, delivery trucks that cross state lines would have to segregate product orders based on whether they were being sold in Maryland or some neighboring state. And then if products are transported by third party, which is common also, you can imagine that that challenge would be magnified. It would also increase costs to consumers and limit the products available to them. Given these additional costs uh, and the cost of compliance, it's highly unlikely that the manufacturers would make their entire product line available, and that would limit consumer choices. Product availability then would be further constrained as out of stock requests would be harder to fulfill because products from other jurisdictions could not just be substituted for products with software installed. And where such products were made available in Maryland, the cost of installing and maintaining the software would increase the price of those products sold in the state. Maryland consumers would then, and we talk about this a lot, be tempted to buy their technology and devices across state lines or from online sellers that are not subject to anything in this bill currently. So with those comments um, and concerns, we urge an unfavorable. Thank you. Seeing no questions, that concludes the in-person unfavorable. Now we'll go to virtual. We have four witnesses that are favorable. So all the virtual witnesses are favorable. And first, we'll start with Peggy Cairns, or is it Carnes? I was thinking Cairns. of the city. Cairns. I, okay, I apologize. I was thinking of the city in Australia. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello, I'm Peggy Cairns, the chair of the education chair of the Maryland Police Coalition Against Pornography, and a mother and a grandmother. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to your committee. We thank the sponsors of this bill, which seek to solve a huge problem facing families today that's beyond solving by parents alone, the dangers to the safety of children presented by unfiltered mobile devices. The approach taken by this bill offers a technically simple, elegant solution. Turn on the filtering by default. To grasp the problem, please watch a free 2020 documentary video entitled Childhood 2.0. The link is in my written testimony. Here are some of the disturbing trends and statistics. 53% of American sh children get a cell phone by age 11. They spend many hours daily on these devices, which are worse addictively than slot machines. 27% of all unfiltered internet con content is explicit or pornographic, and nearly 50% of children have been exposed to it by age eight. 
In 2019, porn sites received more internet traffic than Amazon, Twitter, and Netflix combined. And social media apps are saturated with explicit material. In 2021 alone, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children received nearly 85 million images, videos, and other files related to child sexual abuse and exploitation, and these are only the ones that were reported. Regarding smartphones and tablets, technology is best when it's easy and intuitive to use. This is not the case with filtering technology today. Families need help. It takes a village to raise a child. Device manufacturers need to join our responsible village in Maryland. We parents know manufacturers are capable of turning on the filtering that this bill requires. Government imposes safety regulations to other industries. Think of tobacco and alcohol. Do we put those potentially dangerous products freely in the hands of minors? No. Why should the electronic device industry be so unregulated? In closing, we urge a favorable report on HB 1082. Thank you for the sponsors. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, next, we'll go to Eleanor Gayton. Go ahead, ma'am. There we go. So happy to be here. On behalf of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, we're an organization based in DC, but with stakeholders across the country. And we, our mission is to expose all forms of, of sexual exploitation. I urge you to support HB 1082. It's a strategic solution to protect children from exposure to harmful content online. A couple of very important points. This, is constitu this will pass constitutional muster. The, the Supreme Court has basically recommended that filter technology is like the lowest barrier for adults to have access to sexually explicit content, but it also protects kids. I look forward to a chance to meeting with the Maryland Retailers Association because they are frankly misreading this bill. It has to do with three manufacturers. That is Apple, Google, and Amazon's Fire Tablet. Those are the manufacturers who hold the, the, the copyright for the operating systems that have filters already embedded in these phones. When I activate my phone in Maryland, it will know that I'm in Maryland and will turn on, it will default to safety. It will make that falter go on. Man, retailers have nothing to do with this. When I started my phone, I activated my phone and asked me if I wanted to have a wallet, if I wanted to have a health. These are automatic functions within the phone. You've got to understand that this, these filters are already in the phones. So it, it empowers parents to take control of what material is appropriate for their kids to see. We are getting calls every week from lawyers, from forensic nurses. There's child on child sexual assault occurring because kids mirror neurons cause them to imitate the pornography they are seeing inadvertently. So we have kids harming their neighbors, their cousins, their, their siblings. This is because of inadvertent access to pornography that will be filtered. It's an easy step. It's a first step. And it has nothing to do with most of the points the Retailers Association are claiming. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we'll go to Brickenna Kay. Okay. All right, we'll come back to her. Elena Delap. Hello. Hello, Can go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Um, my name is Elena Delap, and I'm 14 years old. My siblings and I attend schools in the Montgomery County School District. I'm here to testify in support of this bill which will protect kids and teenagers like me from unwanted exposure to inappropriate and harmful material. Many kids come across it accidentally and even teens recognize the value and need for a filtered device. I think the problem of unfiltered devices was made worse by the pandemic. So many kids were suddenly at home on screens all day long. In the fall of 2020, my mom faced the daunting task of monitoring five kids on Zoom schooling, one of whom was a kindergartner. My five-year-old brother was so good at pressing buttons that the school soon called us to let us know that he had somehow created two separate desks on his Chromebook and had signed into both his English and Spanish classes and both teachers and classes could hear each other. I share this just to illustrate the many ways that kids can accidentally do things they didn't mean to do on devices. 
most kids my age have a cell phone um, and other devices as I see at school every day. And the burden that unfiltered devices places on parents is overwhelming, especially to those parents and families where English is not their first language. Can you imagine if your child had the device program in English, but your first language is Arabic? You would need to figure out filters and all the steps to take in another language to protect your child. As young people, we want the freedom to search online and use our devices without running into degrading content. Much of the pornography includes violence against women and children and it is discriminatory against minorities. It does not uplift us or encourage youth to become the people we are capable of becoming and thoughtful citizens in our communities. I encourage you to please pass this bill for your kids, for your grandkids, and they will thank you. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Thank you so much, and thanks for participating, uh, especially at such a young age. It's pretty cool to see. Uh, we'll come back to Brickana Kay. Okay. All right, well, that concludes uh, this bill hearing. Next, we will go to House Bill 1150, Delegate Queen. And you can start when ready, Delegate. Uh, you can bring up your panel. <laughs> you made it back. I did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Everyone has to do what they need to do. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of uh, the Economic Matters Committee. For the record, I'm Delegate Pam Queen and I'm presenting HB 1150, Commercial Law and Financial Institutions Credit Regulation Shared Appreciation Agreement. So this bill really is one of those like technical changes that we need to make, um, and so it's, it is to help consumers understand information better. So HB 1150 is clarifying for consumers that the practice of shared appreciation agreements um, but by establishing a clear licensing and regulatory framework for the oversight of these agreements, including the disclosure as well as other consumer protections inherent in these uh, transactions. So a shared um, appreciation agreement is a mortgage transaction in which the consumer homeowner agrees to share a percentage of the appreciation in the home's value with the lender in exchange for some advanced funds. And so the homeowner must repay the advanced um, and, and the repayments depending on the value of the home um, as it changes, uh, if it changes since the loan's inception. And so we just wanted to make sure that the definition of what this agreement is, is codified in Maryland law, and also to make sure that these agreements are subject to any sort of um, laws and regulations that the Office of uh, Consumer Financial Regulations oversees. And so it's really making that clear and making sure it's um, handled appropriately. And so if you, I will look for a favorable uh, recommendation on this bill. And sir, you, we have here the commissioner here if you have any questions or clarification that's needed. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Vice Chair Crosby, distinguished members of the committee. For the record, I'm Tony Salazar, Commissioner of Financial Regulation, and I want to thank Delegate Queen for introducing HB 1150. I'm here to answer questions and, and request a favorable committee report on. I echo everything the delegate has said, and I'll just add that we appreciate um, see the Consumer Protection Division's uh, letter that you'll have in the record there about these products that they should be covered by current law. We want to be proactive in this space, so that's why we're pleased with the introduction of the bill, because it will eliminate the need to litigate to definitively establish that these products are covered mortgages under Maryland law. We're not alone in pursuing a legislative definition like that. Connecticut recently passed a statute including shared appreciation mortgages in their definition <laughs> of regulated mortgage transactions, so we're closely monitoring that concept as well. And with that, I request a favorable committee report and happy to answer any questions. All right. Seeing no questions. Uh, okay. Uh, and he has signed up. We'll go to uh, the one uh, information, uh, which is virtual, and that is Matthew Windsor.
Hello? Yep, go ahead, sir. We got you. All right. Um, thank you, Chair Wilson and Vice Chair Crosby and members of the committee for the opportunity to comment on HB 1150 concerning the regulation of shared appreciation agreements. My name is Matthew Windsor and I'm Associate General Counsel at Point Digital Finance. We are the nation's leading issuer of shared appreciation agreements, having helped over uh, 10,000 homeowners access the equity in their homes nationwide. As proposed, HB 1150 makes explicit that shared appreciation agreements are subject to regulation as a type of residential mortgage loan. This would require companies like Point to become licensed mortgage lenders, require compliance with Maryland lending laws, and subject them to regulation by the Commissioner of Financial Regulation. I am proud to share that Point has already been in compliance with these requirements for quite some time. We believe that we are the first and to date only shared appreciation agreement company to be licensed by the Commissioner. We have worked closely with the commissioner and his office to ensure that our product complies with Maryland law, and we expect that productive relationship to continue. In general, Point is supportive of measures taken by state regulators and legislatures to enhance consumer protections and clarify the regulatory treatment of shared appreciation agreements. Point also believes it is important to acknowledge the differences in structure between shared appreciation agreements and classic mortgages. Additionally, the industry participants um, in the shared appreciation agreement space are not a monolith and product features can vary significantly from company to company. For example, our product does not have an interest rate nor does it have monthly payments. So regulations requiring rate or payment disclosure should be modified to accommodate those consumer friendly terms. Uh, point also includes a downside sharing provision that may allow for repayment for an amount less than the original investment amount. Uh, this bill's inclusion of provisions allowing the CFR to promulgate regulations regarding enforcement and compliance should be exercised with that flexibility in mind. To that end, we remain committed to working with the commissioner and providing him with uh, industry insight to ensure that this important product remains available to Maryland consumers. Thank you again for the opportunity to comment on HB 1150, and please let me know if I can be of further assistance to the committee regarding this matter. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And seeing no questions, that concludes uh, this bill hearing. Next, we will go to House Bill 634, Thank Delegate you. Vogel. And Delegate, if you want to bring up your panel and start when ready. Vice Chair Crosby, members of the Economic Matters Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before your committee in support of House Bill 634. Uh, first, I would like to thank Lamia and Jane uh, for joining me on this panel and to all the advocates who will be joining us virtually. Dangerously underregulated diet pills pose a significant threat to teenagers across Maryland. Studies show that teenagers who consume diet pills are six times more likely to be diagnosed with an eating disorder. Additionally, these pills have been found to contain pesticides, heavy metals, steroids, and drugs that can lead to strokes, cancer, liver failure, and in some cases, death. Nowadays, kids and teenagers spend an average of seven and a half hours a day on their screens for entertainment through platforms like Instagram. It's on these platforms where young kids and teenagers are exposed to unrealistic and harmful body expectations. Studies, studies have shown correlation between time spent on social media and body dissatisfaction. Diet, pills, diet pill companies have taken advantage of this to push these underregulated diet pills onto young people. HB 634 would restrict the sale of diet pills to Marylanders under the age of 18. Currently, the Federal Food and Drug Administration does not screen diet pills for safety or effic efficacy even though many varieties are known to contain harmful ingredients. Because they're largely underregulated, companies don't report their toxic side effects and consumers are left in the dark. Right here, you will see a picture of the CVS down the street, uh, the weight loss supplement section. Uh, here are a few of, uh, examples of uh, these diet pills uh, that a miner could walk into that CVS and buy right now. Hydroxy cut black. Ultra advanced liquid thermo technology marketed, as in, marketed for intense weight loss. Xantrex Blue. The packaging says that study subjects lost an average of 11.2 pounds in just 45 days. Rapid weight loss, rapid weight loss ultimate meta, me, metabolic stimulator. Relicor, the ultimate super fat burning belly bulge kit, a specialized two part system that reduces overall body fat. Lipazine, marketed for losing pure body fat. 
These products are on the shelves next to your vitamins in the aisle of your neighborhood pharmacy and available for purchase by any 12-year-old desperate to achieve the physique displayed on the box in front of them. Considering this, why would consumers, children among them, think that these products could cause harm? HB 634 seeks to change this, to protect teenagers from these underregulated, overly available, over-the-counter diet pills and ensure that Maryland consumers are protected. This bill does not seek to regulate, to regulate uh, muscle-building supplements. We've included sponsor amendments to more narrowly define what diet pills are. Uh, with amendments, this bill would call for regulation of products packaged with the following phrases. Weight loss supplement, weight management, satisfy hunger, suppress hunger, curb cravings, fat burner, reduce BMI, and appetite suppressant. Following conversations with state consumer protection officials and experts in this space, it was determined that this definition is most effective and could significantly reduce the cost listed on the fiscal note. In response to concerns by the Maryland Retailers Association, sponsor amendments strike requirements that these products be moved behind the counter, as well as provisions that require cross-referencing online sales with a database. Sponsor amendments also lower the punishment to include a warning and investigation prior to issuing a $1,000 penalty. Thank you for your time, and I request a favorable report on HB 634. Chair Wilson, Vice Chair Crosby, members of the Economic Matters Committee, thank you so much for this opportunity to testify before your committee in support of Bill HB 634. My name is Jane Zeltzer, I'm 38 years old and I reside in Baltimore County. I was born in Ukraine and we came here when I was four years old to escape the Soviet Union, the communism and anti-Semitism. When I came here, I just wanted to be the typical American girl. I just wanted to fit in. And by the time I got to high school, I was obsessed with all of the celebrities, much like the teens are now. Uh, I worked 20 hours a week in high school. Therefore, I had the money to go buy anything that I wanted to help me lose weight to fit in. As soon as I got my license, I went straight to Rite Aid and CVS and practically cleared uh, the shelves. Anything that could suppress my appetite, anything that could make me smaller, anything that would make me fit in, I consumed it. And it led to my developing an eating disorder. Some of the symptoms that I experienced were rapid heartbeat. Uh, when I got up too fast, I would pass out. Uh, I, I wasn't sleeping, which led to hallucinations. Um, and after I was diagnosed, I was hospitalized three times because my electrolytes were extremely unstable. I am now recovered from my eating disorder and I'm a, an advocate for the cause. I believe that children, teenagers should be able to have a childhood. Uh, they are bombarded with these messages day in and day out from social media, uh, from TV, and even in their own families, um, you know, to be smaller. And the truth is that all bodies are good bodies. They shouldn't be receiving these messages. They shouldn't have to suffer like I did. You know, they say that um, environment, or excuse me, that genetics load the gun and environment pulls the trigger. And this is a very dangerous environment for children nowadays. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lamia Ayaz, and I'm a junior at Howard High School in Ellicott City, Maryland. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you here today in strong support of HB 634, sponsored by Delegate Vogel. I am 16 years old, and I, alongside my peers, have grown up surrounded by social media. Every single day, starting from the ages of four or five, we are bombarded with images and videos of people's bodies. And the vast majority of this content has heavy editing. Jawlines are enhanced, skin is smoothed, faces are made slimmer, certain features are made larger, and others smaller. It has become the standard, to the point where a 2021 study found that 90% of young women today filter their photos. But it would be ludicrous to suggest that this issue is limited solely to young women. Popular influencers, both male and female, filter and edit their bodies as well. Some with millions of followers promote appetite suppressant candies and diet pills. We have created a culture where body image issues are cultivated for profit. Being exposed to this content once or twice may not be significant. 
But when you are exposed to this content every single day for multiple hours a day, we find ourselves confronted with a much larger issue. We compare ourselves to the content we consume and we begin to find fault with every part of our body. Unattainable and unrealistic images become our standards and for this reason, social media has undoubtedly contributed to the rise of body image issues. It's true that people will often choose short-term benefit over long-term safety, and this is especially true for teenagers. When they see a cunningly marketed solution, a fix-all solution that's supposed to be an easy way to lose large amounts of weight when nothing else has worked, can you really expect vulnerable adolescents to say no? I implore you to vote yes to this bill. Thank you. Uh, before we take questions, I just I should have done this at the outset. Uh, I want to welcome our colleagues from HGO, Delegates Hutchinson, Lewis, and White. Um, with that, Delegate Pippi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Delegate Vogel, uh, good to see you, and great uh, testimony uh, by the young lady from Howard High School. Um, just a technical question. The Department of Health has a letter of, I guess it's a technical opposition letter, and it's about the definition of diet pills, and their concern is that bro that broad definition may include actually some supplements that are, that are healthy and, and helpful potentially to, to young folks, and so I didn't know if your bill, if you were gonna do something with that or if you had a response uh, to that concern, kind of outside the scope of what your bill's doing, but they're just concerned that it's a, it's a very large definition and that it could actually include items that, that could be beneficial, so. Thank you, Delegate. And the amendments that, that we requested, and, and they're available, I think they've been sent to your council, would address that by uh, narrowing the definition of diet pills, uh, specifically around the packaging, right? Okay. And, and some of those terms that I included earlier that you will see on, on some of these uh, diet pill packages, um, by, by making it more so about packaging rather than the ingredients, uh, we can avoid unintended consequences of accidentally including other uh, supplements that could be, as you mentioned, healthy. Okay, yeah, and I thought I was paying attention, but I didn't catch that part, so I apologize, but okay, Great. thank you. Thank All you, right. sir. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yep, come on up. Here, so right here. Delegate Lewis. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Delegate Vogel, for bringing the bill, and thanks to your panel. I'm curious, are there other states that have taken measures like you're describing for Maryland? Yes, in, in other states, the, the bills have passed through the legislatures. I believe California is one example of that. The challenge that other states have had is around implementation, specifically involving the Department of Health, because of what Delegate Pippi just brought up around the definition being broad and then the Department of Health being tasked with having to determine what does and what does not qualify as a diet pill. The amendment that we made seeks to address that. That was an amendment that was made in consultation with um, the Attorney General's Office of Consumer Protection uh, and experts on this issue uh, trying to get around that implementation issue. And if I may follow up question, um, thank you for your answer. Uh, do you have any information about how those states, uh, what sorts of outcomes they're experiencing? Are they seeing other interventions leading to reduction in abuse of diet pills and other uh, social uh, unfortunate outcomes that could follow? So my understanding is that the the, in California, for example, the governor ended up vetoing the bill because of that challenge with the Department of Health. Um, but this is, we're seeking to address that proactively through this amendment, um, and that's what experts concluded would have solved the issue there as well. Um, I can see if there are any other states or, or localities that have gone about um, actually implementing this uh, to see if there are any, any impacts there, but I don't know if you have anything to add from, a, from a, based on your knowledge, which far exceeds mine on this. <laughs> um, not sp uh, just more specifically to, uh to the question that um, you know, there may be some supplements that are actually beneficial to these children. They don't even have, you know, when their parents are really in charge of, of their medical state. Their parents should really be making that decision and they are very poorly regulated. So the supplements that they say are good for them, those supplements may not even be inside that bottle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep, and uh, just quick Google. Uh, California looks like it got through the legislature, was vetoed, and New York has uh, a proposal, but it doesn't look like anything is actually enacted uh, at the moment. Um, so uh, I want to thank you all for your testimony. It was very powerful, um, not just on the topic, ma'am, but also I hope that your family uh, back in Ukraine is safe as well.
All right, that concludes this panel. Uh, we do have numerous virtual witnesses, but we will go to the in-person uh, unfavorable first. I have Robert Marriott, uh, Daniel Fabricant, Steve Mister, and John McClucky. And you can start when ready. Real quick, Ms. Locklear, do you want to come up for uh, your informational at the end? You can just come up and sit on the end. It's okay. You'll go last. And then, four gentlemen, you can start when ready. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Robert Merritt. I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs for the American Herbal Products Association and uh, members of the Sports Nutrition Committee of that association. Uh, my written testimony, as previously submitted, was to the bill as not amended. However, uh, the fundamental problems, which will be gone into by more depth by some of the other uh, witnesses opposed, are twofold. Uh, first, the bill, as described and unfortunately as uh, just expressed in support, mischaracterizes the product class in question, particularly for dietary supplements. Dietary supplements are regulated by the federal government. They are subjected to, subject to re adverse event reporting requirements at the federal level and both manufacturing and products are subject to safety and formulation inspections, including product specification requirements. Uh, products that contain pesticides or heavy metals or drug ingredients that produce adverse events are illegal. They're, they're illegal drugs. They're already illegal under federal law and prohibited from sale in those terms. So it's important to distinguish those when talking about what we're seeking to address here. But this doesn't speak to the larger problem that I see, and the larger problem that this bill doesn't address. Eating disorders are behavioral and mental health problems. And we've just finished hearing a significant amount of testimony, particularly regarding Bill 9, uh, 910, about uh, the actual source of these problems. Messages, social media, marketing, which induces the causes of weight stigma and false beliefs about uh, a healthy or ideal weight, which then produce uh, unhealthy behaviors, including eating disorders, both in terms of product consumption and in terms of other behaviors such as uh, binge purge cycles. Uh, we believe that there are other means which would more effectively address this problem. This bill, well, I'm happy to answer some questions about some of the other issues with using specific label language if my colleagues don't address that. But uh, APA is opposed to this bill. Uh, I would just say APA. No, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Fabricant, Dr. Daniel Fabricant. I am the CEO and president of the Natural Products Association, the oldest and largest trade association representing the supplement industry. Prior to this role, I was the chief regulator for dietary supplements under the Obama administration. Um, I really have grave concerns about H.R. 634. Um, it is, I think, um, a real problem that this narrative gets advanced that the industry is not regulated. I can tell you the folks that are still in federal prisons and the hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, assets that were disgorged from folks um, were very real. So um, we understand the legislation's intent and eating disorders should be taken seriously. Um, but this bill has been vetoed, as mentioned, both in California and New York with good reason. Uh, there's been a lot of miscategorization of what actually constitutes a diet pill. Um, and the laws are in place, and some of the laws are exactly identical to pharmaceuticals, notably adverse event reporting. Adverse event reporting, if there is a problem with a product, that signal goes to the FDA. It's generated to the AAR system, and it's evaluated by medical professionals, both external and inter internal to the agency. And the law requires that AARs received by companies have to be reported to the agency within 15 days. Supporters of this legislation seem to overlook that fact. There is not a single, from the years 2019 to 2020, a single, 2022, a single adverse event report for dietary supplements relating to eating disorders. Um, this is a problem. There is a standard protocol, standard of care, it's in the Pharmacy Licensure of Maryland, called Challenge, Dechallenge, Rechallenge. None of that ever gets mentioned in the causality of dietary supplements and eating disorders. So the hypothesis that a supplement 
wouldn't be picked up by an AER system is completely false. There's a federal system that picks those up already. Uh, we're, again, we're happy to work with the bill's sponsors on education, on dealing with social media, um, but even the, the hopes at getting it claims is, uh, is not realistic because everyday ingredients like magnesium are responsible for fat metabolism, and so things like that would be picked up still by this bill. Good afternoon. My name's Steve Mister. I'm the president of the Council for Responsible Nutrition, but I'm also a lifelong Maryland resident. Raised on the Eastern Shore, graduate of Towson University, the University of Maryland, and now a 30-year resident of Montgomery County. And I'm here today both as a representative of the dietary supplement industry and as a Maryland consumer of supplements, because 634 would restrict access to a broad swath of our safe and beneficial products. Because you see, it's not just the young people who would be impacted. When you place age restrictions on a consumer product, it restricts access for all consumers. Many stores will simply stop carrying the product entirely, and the rest will put these products behind the counter, behind a glass case, in a locked cage, whether expressly required by the legislation or not, for fear of accidentally selling these products to an underage minor and incurring the $1,000 fine that goes with it. I'm a user of some of these products myself, and I want to be able to find them in the store. I want to be able to read labels, to shop the aisle, to compare brands and ingredients, to select the ones that are right for me. If you put these behind the counter, I don't have the opportunity to do that. Adults who have a legitimate reason for wanting access to these products no longer have the ability to self-shop. But now as a representative of the industry, I also want to address the supposed reason behind the bill. The proponents will tell you that dietary supplements lead to eating disorders and body dysmorphia. Now, these illnesses are devastating, no doubt about it, for the people who suffer it and for their families and their friends. So I don't want to be insensitive here, but let me be clear. There is not one bit of evidence that dietary supplements cause these eating disorders. And we've published a, a report as recently as last week that surveys the evidence and shows that. It's convenient to scapegoat one class of products as causing a debilitating interest, illness, but that would be wrong. I would urge you today to oppose this legislation and not to allow a motion to mislead you here. Please do not pass 634. Well, thank you, Vice Chair, distinguished members of the committee for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Robbie McLucky, and I work for the Consumer Healthcare Products Association, representing the manufacturers of over-the-counter medicine, dietary supplements, and consumer medical devices. I'm here to testify today in opposition to House Bill 634. I've also submitted my written testimony for the record. While we share the concern about challenges associated with eating, eating disorders among segments of the American population, we disagree that limiting access to legitimate OTC diet products and weight loss supplements is an effective solution that, to this specific problem. Ultimately, this bill threatens the availability of legitimate, of legitimate consumers to affordability to, to access beneficial supplements that that a portion of the population find useful and necessary. This bill presents the most restrictive dietary supplements proposal in the United States. It goes far beyond what any state has attempted to pass and certainly further than what the federal government deems necessary. Beyond age restriction, the bill mandates product placement in a store and even attempts to acquire personally identifiable information from the consumer at the time of purchase. These restrictions not only make these important products less accessible, but it taints them as unsafe and not recommended for use a claim we vehemently disagree with. Bottom line, this type, these types of laws are unenforceable. That was demonstrated by the governors of states of New York and California when they vetoed age restriction legislation that passed in their legislatures just this past year. They vetoed the bills because of an inability to identify what products come under the law and which ones don't. Dietary supplements play a critical role in the wellness regime of millions of Americans. Instituting the restrictions in this bill will have a negative impact on public health. We welcome the opportunity to work with Delegate Vogel and this committee on this bill, but at this time, we are opposed, and I appreciate the time to address you today. Thank you. Yep, and we'll go to Ms. Locklear, but just a reminder for everybody, she is information. <laughs> Don't worry, it's the last and final time you will see me at this table today. So for the record, again, Kaylee Locklear here on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association here in an informational capacity. I do want to start by thanking the sponsor who has met with us numerous times on this bill because in its original form, we would have opposed it because of the requirements and serious penalties. But should all the amendments we've discussed be adopted um, by this committee, we would be neutral on this bill. So just to give you a couple of those problems, um, we'd actually 
likely, should this committee believe this is a problem, be fine with IDing. Um, but locking the product up, putting it behind the counter, um, we don't have space to do that. These are hundreds and hundreds of products that are covered here, so that's not going to be able to be operationalized. There is a signage requirement in the bill that we think would be very concerning and confusing to consumers. It talks about tachycardia, other things that potentially could happen. Well, there's a lot of over-the-counter products, especially in a pharmacy, that can cause a lot of issues. So signage does not make sense to us, and historically, um, that information is required um, as a warning by the FDA on labels, and I can talk a little bit more about what is and what isn't required. Um, for the violation portion of the bill, I know the sponsor did mention, um, we changed that to areas of law where we provide a warning. We provide an opportunity to interact with an agency and then that they may issue a fine. Um, we have a lot of turnover. We've talked about that a lot this year. A 16-year-old a, as a cashier may just make uh, an error. We'd, we'd like that to be considered. There is a new amendment about phrasing on labels to make a determination to card. Um, but And we talked about this earlier. That's going to have to be significantly narrowed. Otherwise, literally every cashier will have to sit there and figure out if some of this ver verbiage or significantly similar verbiage is found on that label. So wanted to share those comments with you. Again, glad to answer any questions the committee has. Okay, seeing no questions, that can... Well, Delegate Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, to the gentleman, you said you consumed these supplements before. Have you consumed fat, fat burner uh, supplements before? I have. Do, and they work? If you are looking to lose 30 pounds, they are not your solution. You need to see a doctor and be under advice. If you're looking to, say, lose five pounds in the next month because your 20th class reunion's coming up, yes. And there is plenty of research that demonstrates that. Okay, thank you. I clearly moved way too fast. Uh, Delegate Sample Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, panel, for uh, your testimony on today. Uh, information purposes. <laughs> Can you just elaborate for me? Because I'm just trying to understand how that would work. Um, the part about the phrasing on the labels, I'm not familiar with that. Can you share that a little bit more? Yeah, so I would say the bill probably started... Um, and a little bit of a better stance, and again, we talked about that, that this morning, there was some really broad language around drugs and products that could be captured, but then as you moved on in the bill, it actually went on to target like creatine, green tea extract, raspberry ketone, things of that nature. So if you narrowed it down there, that would be much better, but the amendment that was shared with us earlier says that the package that contains at least one of the following phrases or a substantially similar phrase would then trigger us to have to ID. So it would have to say something like weight loss supplement, weight management, satisfy hunger, suppress hunger, curb cravings, reduce cravings, feel fuller, feel lighter, fat blocker, fat burner, sculpt, skim. I could keep going on. Mm -hmm. And that's it. what presents the problem for us when someone's checking somebody out where you go, <laughs> Oh my gosh, hold on. This is going to capture a lot of products that we have. Okay. Um, so you're, you're just essentially saying that that's, that's going to be um, a difficult process for someone who's going to check these products out. They would have to go through that, or would it be able to be um, like on a label that the merchandiser uses to just automatically trigger that versus a specific cashier looking at labels. So I thought I think that there this might be another way to address that. I thought that this question might come up. Um, so just so the committee is aware, dietary supplements do fall under a different set of F FDA regulations, and that's different than conventional foods. So those FDA regulations very clearly say that manufacturers and distributors of dietary supplements and dietary ingredients are prohibited from marketing products that are adulterated or misbranded. That means that these firms are responsible for evaluating the safety and labeling of their products before marketing to ensure that they do meet 
all the requirements that the FDA lays out. And the FDA has authority to take action against any adulterated or misbranded product or supplement after it comes to market. Okay, thank you. Delegate Boafo. All right, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I think someone on the panel mentioned the FDA regulations being so strict and stringent. Uh, as you may know, there's a 2020 Harvard uh, School of Public Policy study that talks about a 94 federal law that actually says the opposite. So I just want to put that on the record to say happy to talk to you more in depth offline as we try to debate this. That's uh, fine. Clearly I, important. I was a chief regulator, and there are people, um, all of us from the trade can testify to that there are people in jail for breaking dietary supplement laws. Great. Thank you. Um, and the second question, uh, really for you, Mr. Garza, about uh, specifically about um, do you believe that there are, is any evidence that these products actually do cause uh, eating disorders? I mean, obviously, we've heard testimony from folks. There's some additional testimony in our floor system. But talk to me a little bit from, from your perspective. About sure. That. So the proponents of the, of the legislation often will try to create the impression that there is a causal connection here, that using dietary supplements is somehow the gateway and then causes people to develop eating disorders. Uh, We've never been able to find any evidence of that. And so this year we commissioned an outside organization, gave them a restricted grant, and asked them to do a survey of the scientific literature. That has just been published in the last week in the journal Nutrients. And it found that there was no evidence, no evidence, of any causal relationship between the use of dietary supplements and eating disorders. Now, as you heard from the uh, proponents, there is some uh, uh, indication that people who have eating disorders may use dietary supplements, but you know, unfortunately, because of the, the complex etology of the, of the disease, uh, there's a lot of unhealthy behaviors that go along with eating disorders and body dysmorphia, overeating, undereating, compulsive exercise. One of the many behaviors that sometimes show, shows up is that they will use and abuse various supplements, but that does not mean that they are the causal connection to the supplements. Thank you so much. I Congressman, think if I can add one thing on that. There are actually... Yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Uh, I, I was going to say, just for the record as well, I think it will be great for the committee to get uh, that study um, in addition to that, and happy to talk offline a little bit more about the FDA regulations, because I do think holistically that that kind of sets the tone for the, the debate that we're having here in this committee. Thank you. Delegate Amprey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so my question more so goes to how these products are marketed and who your target audience is and how do you all determine who you want to market the product to, how, who is it marketed and what kind of guardrails do you have in place on marketing to, to, to ensure that you're hitting the target audience that needs these type of supplements? There are marketing guidelines, actually, um, and there's a lot of interest from the Federal Trade Commission, so we don't just have FDA regulating the space. We also have the F Federal Trade Commission, uh, and they have guidelines on what you can say about products for weight loss and things of that nature as well in advertising, so it's not over the line. Uh, so it's a clear, direct communication of what you can expect that it doesn't promote unrealistic results. Also, most of the products um, that have some sort of thermogenic nature, but not all, because, again, there are, there are benign products like magnesium involved in fat metabolism, you're not going to see an age restriction on those, right? Everyone's child's vitamin has magnesium in it, which supports fat metabolism. But specific to a weight loss or, or body composition type product, most of them have uh, statements and they're voluntary statements not to be used for 18 and older. And all of them, at least all the labels we've seen, and again, I used to be the regulator, say consult your physician before using or healthcare practitioner. Yeah, if you have more to add, please. Sure, just briefly, uh, in speaking with our members from the sports nutrition industry, uh, the folks who are following the law and following formulation, kids are not the target demographic here. Uh, the target demographic is adults who are engaged in an active lifestyle or specifically athletes. Uh, there is concern that in some cases it may be appropriate for someone under the age of 18 to use these products, um, including under adult or uh, clinician supervision. Uh, but in, in speaking with our members, they're not advertising directly to kids. The folks who are doing that frequently, the, the, the behaviors that we're hearing about uh, are coming from other sources in social media or coming from the folks who are selling the illegal products. Okay, if I can ask one more follow-up question. So is, what type of 
education or, or systems of um, information are you doing to, to, to safeguard the products currently from, from the youth? We, we reach out frequently to medical societies to inform them about the adverse event reporting system. Um, the adverse event reporting system at FDA, there are actually drugs they've added black box warnings to because of the adverse event reporting system that elucidate an eating disorder. Things like topramate, which is used in children for seizures, actually produces anorexia. They added that warning a few years ago because of that adverse event reporting system. So back to the discussion on causality, that's really the critical piece is that physicians know there's an adverse event reporting system. They can, if there's a problem, it goes to FDA, it can be addressed. We'd certainly be open to having a conversation about educational efforts in this area as well. All right, great. Thank, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Seeing no additional questions, we will now go to the virtual favorable witnesses. First, I have Cheung Po. No? Okay. Arshina Verma. Okay. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Hello, members of Maryland State Representatives. I'm Arshia Verma, a freshman at the University of Texas at Austin. And today I'm testifying through my involvement with the Youth Advocacy Corps of the Harvard University Strategic Training Initiative for the Prevention of Eating Disorders. Through this testimony, I hope to share the important research backing Bill 634. I grew up in Elkridge, Maryland, and this bill is deeply important to me because it will protect the health of countless youth in Maryland by prohibiting the sale of over-the-counter diet pills to minors. I implore you to vote in favor of this bill that will take care of your young and impressionable constituents. All around Maryland, there are pharmacies, grocery stores, and local corner stores with readily available diet pills that are accessible to consumers of any age. Even online, they are easy to buy from Amazon, Walmart, and other similar vendors with no restriction on age. These diet pills and supplements are widely underregulated by the FDA and have been shown time and time again to have harmful impacts on users' health. As an 18-year-old girl, I understand the heavy influence of social media, marketing, and beauty standards that may drive youth just like me to seek out these products in hopes of losing weight and fitting in. However, what most, people, what most young people don't know is that these supplements are often laced with banned pharmaceuticals, heavy metals, pesticides, and other toxic ingredients. With the American Academy of Pediatrics releasing reports strongly cautioning against teens using these diet pills, it only makes sense to take these substances out of teens' hands. And with the high linkage of these products with eating disorders and anabolic steroid use, it is imperative that we address the problem early on. In an effort to serve in the state youth's best interest, I strongly urge you to vote in support of Bill 634. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Paree Patel. Yes, hello. Go ahead, start when ready, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, members of Maryland uh, Economics Matters Committee. My name is Pari Patel. I'm a college student and resident of Hagerstown, Maryland, here to share my personal story about the dangers of over-the-counter diet pills. Being an athlete and playing at high levels in my adored sport of basketball, it soon occurred to me that I would fall physically behind in comparison to my teammates. This fear developed into a deep want for growth and maintaining a certain physique. I was exposed to supplements at the age of only 14 as a competitive athlete. I turned to over-the-counter diet pills as a way to see immediate results. During this period of struggle, I went to my local grocery store and saw aisles and aisles of various types of supplements. I decided to try a version of every diet pill on the shelves. Unfortunately, no one was there to speak to me about the dangers of these products, and my friends, coaches, and teammates even recommended the use of these supplements. Was everyone sucked into this whirlwind of marketing hype and deception? With no prior experience in this realm, the only source of information I had was the internet, which was too severely biased and exaggerated the benefits of supplements greatly. Finally, through deep research, I eventually realized that these supplements might be dangerous, but still it was hard for me to believe because I was so firmly trusted in our government that they would not let dangerous products like this be sold to me. I was convinced that our government would put a stop to this if these supplements were truly bad. It took me over four years to overcome the consequences of these diet pills and completely get over my disordered eating. This bill has been introduced in New York, California, Massachusetts, and New Jersey, and we must prioritize the health and well-being of our young people. It is time for our government to take action and ban the sale of dangerous over-the-counter diet pills to youth. 
We need legislation that's going to protect our youth from the predatory practices of the supplement in the industry. These products are marketed towards young people and they prey on their vulnerabilities and insecurities and promise quick and easy results. Letting these supplements go unregulated means taking away immense potential in each of these young teens at an early age. Ms. Patel, I think we do have a question uh, for you uh, by another member. Do you have a second? Yeah. All course. right, Delia Lewis. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Patel, for your testimony and for sharing your personal story. Um, you should know that when folks come to share their personal experiences, it really helps the members to understand the, the, the issue, so thank you. My question for you is this. This bill proposes to basically make it harder for young people to get their hands on products like you know, diet uh, supplements. If this bill were enacted, if it had existed for you, would it have stopped you from getting your hands on dietary supplements? Or would you, as a clever young person determined to excel in athletics, would you have found another way to get them? Yes, absolutely. So I think this, um, if this bill was in place, I would not be taking, I would not have taken those supplements and I would be in good health right now um, because those supplements led me to having disordered eating and led me to uh, being in bad health. Um, and I think the fact that it's restricted, that it would be restricted for uh, youth under 18 um, is really beneficial because I had my interest in medicine. I took the um, initiative to research um, and look further into diet pills but not every athlete uh, wants like would do that, right? Because they are solely focused on their physique and how they want to um, look like, and they would go to any measure, right? And parents aren't there to stop their children because it's not a known issue. Um, and with this bill, it would become you know a true issue. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Thank you, and thanks for sharing your story, Ms. Patel. Uh, your testimony actually goes to how I kind of think of the bill. Um, I can remember being in high school uh, and in college, obviously it wouldn't apply to college, but when you're in certain sports to try to make weight, uh, nobody would think that here I am, uh, you know, I'm relatively slim, but, you know, I would be taking a diet pill. But I can assure you I've taken numerous diet pills to try to cut 15 pounds in two days on a bike and trash bags, you know, in the shower, riding a bike. Uh, not that that's the most healthy practice, uh, but it's certainly part of, of this bill, and uh, obviously my parents had no idea that I had probably ever done that, um, and it's just because I could go into whatever, you know, grocery store or GNC and get whatever product, and then we would all pop them and be in there trying to shed weight. So I do appreciate you coming here and testifying. Uh, it means a lot. Seeing no further questions, that concludes this bill hearing. Next, we'll go to House Bill 1205, Delegates Miller and McComas, and I want to thank uh, our colleagues from HGO for coming over. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, and my esteemed colleagues on the Mighty Economic Matters Committee. I am Delegate April Miller, and I am here to ask you for a favorable report on the proposed amended version of House Bill uh, 1205. Uh, my intent with this bill is solely to help and protect consumers. I do, however, understand the impact on businesses, especially small businesses. My proposed amendment would adjust the bill to read that, and I apologize you don't have them in print yet. I did send them over to the amendment office. It would propose that an opt-in option will be prominently listed on the contract that will allow consumers to check to receive a receipt via either designated text message or email of the recurring charge. This information will include the charge amount, the contract end date, and company contact details, as well as information about how to cancel. Have you ever had an annual renewal charge for something that you didn't even remember using and then try to get it removed, but you ended up still paying for the unwanted service for another year? Have charges ever showed up on your credit card bill every month and you had no idea where they were from? When you signed up for it, or even if you're child might have, 
This bill would allow you to consider, to have an easier option to track these subscriptions that can quickly get out of hand for many families. A recent bank rate survey showed that 51% of Americans have ended up with unwanted charges from a subscription or a membership. Chase Bank has found that around 71% um, waste over $50 a month on these charges. These unwanted charges cut across income levels. 59% of households over 100,000 and 49% of households under 50,000. So I want you to try to take a minute to add up all the subscription services that you have right now. Netflix, Prime, Hulu, Spotify, Noom, Apple, Bark, HelloFresh, Beauty Fix, ESPN, the list is endless. We all, know, we all know that financial literacy is one of the topics that needs to be better addressed in our Maryland high schools. 57% of millennials and Gen Zs have reported unaccept, unexpected subscription charges, especially after the COVID quarantines. WeAreThrift.com reports that 96% of adults have at least one video streaming and 80% of music one. And on an average cost of all the subscriptions adding up to around $278 a month, up to around $377 a month for our Gen Zers. According to the AARP, consumers underestimate the amount they spend on monthly subscriptions by about 250%. They think they are only spending around $86 when they are actually spending about $219. There are even companies that offer to help you cancel or track unwanted subscriptions. However, they are, they are often subscriptions themselves. We need to allow consumers an opportunity to receive the information they need to track these charges before they just show up on their credit card. We do not all have incredible business skills. Most of us are just trying to get through every day of our very busy lives. And every regular person, not the ones that I talk to on this committee about it, but every regular person that I talk to about this, because you guys are incredible with business, um, about this bill, had a personally, personal experience of being negatively impacted by an automatic renewal or subscription services, and every one of them thought that this was a needed bill. And while you may hear different types of industry leaders um, challenge this bill, I would ask you to think of the people in your district that are struggling to pay their bills every month. And if just this one piece of proposed transparency would help them manage their monthly budget, then I say that that's a win. So I thank you for your time and request a favor report on the amended House bill, which I will send the e that in uh, your inboxes as soon as I can. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Delegate Miller, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Seeing no questions, right. uh, we will go to the unfavorable. Thank you. Uh, guess who? <laughs> Dr. No. <laughs> Robert Enton. It's an amended version. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Robert Enton on behalf of the Maryland Bankers Association. Uh, we are opposed to this legislation. If I look around the room and I look at the folks behind me, um, and for myself, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I might have a dozen auto automatic payments. Um, most of them are relatively small, if it's you know Spotify or, or whatever it is. But I also have them for my mortgage. I have them for my auto loan. I have them for my, uh, the company that delivers uh, heating oil to my house. For the, uh, uh, and and I, the reason I have those is because I don't want to miss a payment. I don't want to make a late payment. I don't want to have a late payment charge. Um, you know, late payment charges are, are, are not small. And it's a convenience for the consumer and for the business both to be able to manage your affairs like this. If you want to terminate it, I mean, you know, you, you, you're paying it. Basically, you set them up online so, you, you know, you know how to use your computer. And if you want to terminate it, you go online and terminate it. And that's today's world. Um, I don't know whether any other state has done this or not, but I just think it's, it's just really problematic, not just for the businesses that I represent, but, and the banks that I represent, but also for the for, for consumers. It's a convenience. And I don't think it's that difficult to terminate it. I've terminated them. Um, and, you know, you set it up online, and you terminate it online. And I also find that, for the most part, the, the, the people that you're paying 
if you attempted to terminate it and you couldn't, they're, they're going to work with you. They want your business. They want you to come back, whatever. They're not looking to stiff you or charge you for some service that you didn't want or that you attempted to terminate. For, uh, for those reasons, we're opposed to the bill. I haven't seen the amendments, but the way they were described to me, I still don't think that we would, uh, I think we would probably remain opposed. But I'll be happy to take a look at them and get back to the committee. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Enton. Seeing no questions, that concludes this bill hearing. Next, we will go to House Bill 920, Delegate Watson. And you can start when ready. Welcome back, Delegate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's been a long hearing, but I promise that these two bills are going to be short and very interesting. I am presenting House Bill 920, and 920 deals with technological changes in the automotive industry. This bill deals with windshields and other automotive safety glass features and a process known as recalibration. Windshields in nearly all current model cars today are filled with cameras and other sensors, all of which are precisely calibrated in order to function properly. These features are known as advanced driver assistance systems. It's necessary to recalibrate these systems on the entire vehicle so that the vehicle may perform properly. The facility must be equipped to recalibrate the cameras and the sensors that are in a windshield when there is an accident or the windshield is damaged. Without such precise recalibration, the systems that notify the driver of potential operating hazards may malfunction. The, the consequences of non-performing an ADAS from an improper repair are serious and potentially life-threatening. If a recalibration is off by just a millimeter, a serious accident could occur. HB 920 simply imposes a set of consumer notifications about the need for proper recalibration in the replacement of automobile safety glass. It also requires a glass shop before it begins repairs to inform the consumer of ADAS recalibration and provide the consumer with a statement that the work performed will meet manufacturer specifications. The bill also prohibits charges for services that are not successfully completed. So to summarize, the bill imposes necessary, common sense, consumer notification requirements for this service. For this reason, I respectfully request a favorable report on H bill, House Bill 920, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have after the panel proceeds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Bryson Pop, I'm appearing before you uh, in favor of House Bill 920 on behalf of SafeLight. Uh, you probably know that SafeLight is a leader in automotive glass uh, repair, replacement, and recalibration. Um, this is the second step of a two-step process. The first began in Delegate Fraser Hidalgo's former committee with the passage of House Bill 519 two years ago. That bill required that the, excuse me, the specifications of an ADAS system be set forth in Motor Vehicle Administration regulations. That has been accomplished. We worked uh, hard with the MBA to get that bill through, uh, and we're happy that it's there. This bill is a consumer protection bill, but more important, it's a consumer safety bill. It deals with the human element of this, not just the equipment. Um, and I know some believe that uh, this part could also be dealt with in regulations. Uh, let them speak their piece. We believe this is the right place for uh, these important consumer safety uh, notifications to be. Uh, and therefore, we respectfully request a favorable report on House Bill 920. Mr. Chair, and oh. yeah. thank you. Mr. Chair and House Economic Matters Committee members, thank you for the privilege of being here today. I'm Deb Levy, and I'm the chair of the Board of Directors of the Autoglass Safety Council. AGSC is a not-for-profit council dedicated to the safe installation of autoglass. Our members include everyone from installation shops to car manufacturers and insurance companies, all dedicated to safety. 
Well, AGSC has also developed the Aggress standard, Auto Glass Replacement Safety Standard, which is a nationwide standard that is used for all aspects of auto glass uh, replacement. It's promulgated under the ANSI rules for fairness and openness. While AGSC supports the spirit of this House bill, we feel it is unnecessary and redundant and may lead to confusion. I'll explain. In 2021, the General Assembly enacted legislation by Chairman Brave and Senator West that directed the MVA to adopt replacement safety standards that met or exceeded the aggressed standards. Early last year, the MVA issued those regulations, and they closely mirror the aggressed standard. Late last year, AGSC let the MVA know that it had, uh, had made updates to the standard and requested uh, adaptation of those standards. Uh, we sent a letter, and a copy of it is in, attached to my testimony. We understand that the request is currently under consideration. The updated standard requires the items that are included in this bill today. All that we believe need be done here is an update of the current regulation. Adding another law just two years after the last one we believe is unnecessary and could be confusing and lead both auto glass companies and consumers to not understand the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank you for bringing the bill. I like the bill. Um, it talks about writing, the notifying the customers in writing. I mean, that doesn't really seem like a, a negative on the bill. Uh, it says may not charge for services that are not performed successfully or completed, I, I would hope. Uh, I think that is pretty self-explanatory. Um, is there been any talk about this being, a, I guess, Bryson, you can answer this. Um, being changed uh, not in law but just I guess in regular the regulatory um, I, I just would look at Watson may want to address that first I'm going to uh, just say this this is this has been around mm -hmm. and it hasn't been addressed right so I'm always That's what more, I'm, getting at. I'm yeah. always more comfortable if we put it in if it's consumer protection mm -hmm. I'm always more comfortable if we put it in the law ourselves rather than you know if, if it had been done already we wouldn't be here right I get it. Thank you very and, much. And to underscore that, this language is in the right place. It's, it's the, the Consumer Protection Division of the Attorney General's Office as your enforcement officer, not the Motor Vehicle Administration. If we ever change the bill to, as some have suggested, include insurance, for example, that's regulated by someone else completely. Yeah, so you, the bill has the language in the right spot. That's where it should be. Agree. Thank you very much. All right, seeing no further questions, this concludes that, uh, this panel, and we will go to Scott Zajic. I'm, I'm, hap I'm happy to advise you, and I hope I get some credit, that Mr. Zike is not here today. Oh, I apologize. Oh, man, I butchered that bad. Okay. Uh, and Franz Schneiderman. You can start when ready, Franz. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Crosby, members of the committee, for the opportunity to address the bill. My name's Franz Schneiderman. I'm with Consumer Auto Maryland. We work for safety and fairness and transparency for Maryland drivers and consumers. I mean, you know, I'm favorable with amendments because I, I support the bill in principle strongly. We do need clearer and stronger uh, repair standards for the safety glass ADS, AS repairs. There's clear evidence that the ADAS systems front collision warnings, et cetera, really can help uh, prevent crashes on the road. But there's also clear evidence that the repairs are a problem. Uh, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety had a study that showed two-thirds of people who've had these things repaired have ongoing problems, and they have to take them back to the repair shops repeatedly, and they're expensive repairs. So stronger, clearer standards for these, uh, and making clear that repair shops have to meet or exceed um, manufacturer's guidelines is a good thing. My concern is that I just don't think the dis consumer disclosures here are very strong. I mean, all it really requires the um, repair shops to disclose is that you need a recalibration and to let you know that they haven't been able to do it if they're not able to do that. And as I believe a, a letter from the 
uh, consumer protection folks at the AG's office explains those minimal uh, things are merely material facts that they would need to be would need to be disclosed under current consumer protection laws. So that doesn't really do much to help consumers. Last year's bill had some language uh, on the same topic, but it had language that required repair shops to disclose how much the insurer would cover, which would let people know what it would cost them out of pocket to get the repairs done. Also, language referring people to a, another repair shop or a motor dealer to get the repairs done if that repair shop couldn't do the repairs. We think that kind of language is helpful to consumers, so we'd ask you folks to amend the bill to add that sort of language. Thank you, and thank you to Delegate Watson for bringing the bill, because uh, the safety standards really are an important issue here. All right. Thank you, Mr. Schneiderman. Dave, uh, sorry, Delegate Fraser Adaga. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Franz. It's good to see you. Um, very quickly, have you worked with the bill sponsor? Have you worked to, to address any of these um, before the prior to the bill hearing? No, unfortunately, I haven't had had the time had the chance to do that as yet. Uh, you know, I and I don't have specific language in mind. Um, you know, I'd be happy to, to <laughs> discuss some language that would improve the disclosures for consumers. But no, I haven't had the opportunity to do that as yet. Okay, well, I mean, I would I would just strongly. It's, this is not your first rodeo, and I would strongly. <laughs> I would strongly encourage you to, to get with the bill sponsor much earlier as opposed to, you know, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, seeing no further questions, that concludes this panel. We do have one unfavorable, uh, and it's virtual, Joshua Fisher. Mr. Fisher, go ahead and start uh, when ready. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Josh Fisher. I am here on behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. We are a trade association representing vehicle manufacturers, automated vehicle developers, EV battery producers, and automotive suppliers. I'm here today to request an unfavorable report on House Bill 920. As you know, vehicles of today are outfitted with numerous cameras and sensors, including many behind the windshield. Uh, that must be checked and calibrated to ensure that the vehicle's uh, safety systems are functioning properly. Proper camera and sensor calibration are vital to the performance of a vehicle safety systems. Um, our concerns with uh, House Bill 920 I'll, I will outline uh, right now. So we think, I, I heard what the sponsor said about the, um, the notice to the consumer. We, we think the language needs to be tightened up a little bit. Um, we think it lacks consumer protections that are, are really critical. So the first issue for us is that uh, the bill doesn't require a glass facility to provide a written statement. It just says a statement. Uh, last year's bill had language requiring a written statement. Uh, we think uh, statements in writing are, are much more valuable than just a, uh, a verbal statement to the consumer. Uh, next, uh, the bill also mentions um, that a glass facility may not charge for a service uh, that are not performed or successfully completed. We think that's still permissive. Uh, it should be shall not charge. Uh, may not still, uh, from our perspective, a little too permissive. Um, and then finally, House Bill 920 also provides that a uh, motor vehicle glass facility shall inform the customer if the recalibration or of an advanced driver system is required and is not performed or successfully completed. So when you take all this together, House Bill 920 seems to permit a glass facility to not perform the recalibration of the ADAS system, still charge the customer, and then only provide a verbal statement to the consumer about whether the work was completed or not. And we don't think that's adequate enough uh, protection for consumers. And that's why we're requesting an unfavorable report today. So thank you for your consideration of our position. Delgate Chi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'm trying to understand uh, your position, uh, Mr. Um, you are saying this is not strong enough in consumer protection. Are you saying this bill does not go far enough? And, and, and more importantly, I'm wondering if it's because you're concerned that if the glass facility that does the repair, repair work does not do enough to notify consumers that you might be held accountable for any defects down the road. Is that right? Because I'm trying to understand what is your interest in this whole, in this whole conversation. Our interest is consumer protection, and obviously, uh, the the facility is recalibrating our members' equipment, right? Um, so, but we're coming to this from a consumer uh, protection perspective, and again, we're not necessarily opposed to the idea of the bill or the intent of the bill. But again, it's some of that language we think needs to be tightened up in there, just to, so it's clear what the requirements are for a facility in terms of their obligations to the consumer. 
Okay, so you're not, just to be clear, you're not opposed to the spirit of this bill, which is notification, right? And, uh, you know, I, if, if the proponents um, had come to us uh, prior to this, we would certainly, or after this hearing, to engage in conversations, we'd certainly welcome that opportunity. We're not opposed to the idea of what Safe Light is, is trying to do here. It's more, really, the, the language we think needs to be improved. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions. That concludes this bill hearing. Next, we will go back to Delegate Watson, House Bill 907. And you can start when ready, Delegate. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Economic Matters Committee. This is House Bill 907, which is also a consumer protection bill. It has to do with elevator service contracts. And I bet that each of you have had this happen in your district, although you may not be aware of it, but it happened quite frequently during the pandemic. Um, the bill originated as a concern from a constituent because an age-restricted condominium in which she lived had a broken elevator. The elevator was out of service for three weeks. Many of the residents were not able to navigate steps. One woman had dialysis three times a week and they needed to get... Um, police officers in to help her down the steps, up and down the steps three times a week. Some were not able to leave their floor for the entire three weeks. And there have been at least two other similar examples in my district, including one at a senior apartment building and another at an age-restricted condominium building. In the first case that I described, the condominium board of directors found that the elevator service contract would not permit the board to order the part and repair from another elevator service vendor without penalty. Even though their own service provider was unable to get the part in a timely manner and take care of the repair, if they had gone ahead and contracted or asked another elevator service repair company to step in and repair the elevator, they would have, the contract would have been null and void. And the penalty for that was that the condominium board would be liable for the remaining fees on the five-year contract, which was thousands of dollars. So this bill is very simple. It says that the landlord or condominium association may enter a contract without pen penalty if there is an elevator in a multifamily dwelling with residents 60 years or older or a disabled resident, if the elevator is out of service, and if the new elevator service contractor can repair the elevator before the existing service contractor can do so. There is an amendment which we delivered to you today that clarifies the bill applies to both to all forms, so not just apartment buildings but condominiums as well, so to landlords, to um, landowners, and to HOAs or condominium associations. There's favorable written testimony in your file from residents of the condominium buildings that I mentioned, as well as the Howard County Department of Community Resources and the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Coalition. Today with us, we have one virtual witness who is, was a resident and is the one who brought this matter to my attention. Her name is Nancy Davis. All right, we'll take uh, Ms. Davis and then we'll come to questions. So next, excuse me, uh, Travis. So Ms. Travis, if you want to go ahead. Um, yes, I'm not sure if it's showing there. It's not showing on my screen, but yep, we got in you. any go case, ahead. Uh, just a clarification. It was not the police who came in and moved the, the dialysis, our neighbor with dialysis down the stairs. The resident had to find their, they, I guess, located family members that came three times a week to carry the wheelchair down the stairs, out, going and back up the stairs, incoming. I personally suffered knee trauma and had to undergo three weeks of physical therapy for my knee after the fact, even though I limited my uh, ingress and egress to no more than once a day, three times a week. There's a couple other things that um, I wanted to point out on this. In addition to all of the, I think this jeopardizes the health of the residents here who most of them in our building are over age 70, not even though it's 55 plus community, for missed, delayed or postponed medical appointments due to the fact they could not get in and out of the building. Um, there's no assistance through the Department of Aging, and the one that occurred several years ago where paramedics had to come for several people with cardiac conditions 
and transport them out of the building for medical issues. I heard after the fact is that now there is a fee for any such incidents if they occur in the future. Uh, there's also difficulty um, in retrieving your mail from the downstairs lobby, getting groceries, attending any classes or outgoing ventures that you go to, any kind of function, functions or things like that. I think it's very injurious, not only to the physical, but to the mental health of the residents to allow them to do this strictly because of their restrictive contracts, which um, through the state elevator inspector I had heard secondhand is very common in that service industry. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, perfect timing. Seeing no questions, that concludes this bill hearing. Uh, next, we will go to House Bill 776, which is the Office of the Attorney General. Uh, and Ms. Forsyth, do you have a panel? Uh, yes. Okay. Just one. <laughs> We're actually both from the Office of the Attorney General. Okay. Go ahead when ready. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, um, Vice Chair Crosby and members of the Economic Matters Committee. Uh, thank you for your opportunity to engage um, on this very important topic. My name is Shanette Walker, and I am Chief of the Antitrust Division in the Attorney General's Office. The, only, the Attorney General's um, Antitrust Division requests that you report favorably on House Bill 776 which has proposed amendments and which would require pre-merger notification to the Attorney General for mergers and acquisitions impacting Maryland markets and valued at over $10 million. The bill would also clarify that restitution is, as listed in the Maryland Antitrust Act includes disgorgement. I'd like to make just three points today. First, some of the opposition that I have read and have heard seems to view HB 776 as a standalone provision. It is not. HB 776 only applies to acquisitions that fall under the Maryland Antitrust umbrella. The Maryland Antitrust Act is only concerned about acquisitions where the effect of such acquisition may be substantially to lessen competition or to create a monopoly. Our concern is only where companies combine in ways that adversely affect competition. So the Maryland Antitrust Act is not concerned with ordinary course uh, real estate transactions, inheritances, farm sales, acquisitions made solely for investment purposes, and many others that are exempted either outright in the bill itself or under existing Maryland state antitrust law or things that are actually exemptable under the bill um, in the language at 11205E2, which says that the Attorney General may exempt classes of persons, acquisitions, transfers, or transactions that are not likely to violate the antitrust laws. And this is similar to the language that is in um, the federal pre-merger notification law, which is at um, 15 U.S.C. 18 A D 2 B. And if anybody is interested in the um, text of that uh, particular statute, I have copies that I can um, provide to you. So essentially, the um, uh, HB 776 exemptions are similar um, in scope to the federal um, HSR, Hot Cart Scott Rodino Act exemptions. And we have listened to the uh, opposition uh, to this bill and responded with what we think are sensible proposed amendments that address some of those concerns. So the proposed amendments um, would uh, uh, endeavor to have a higher notification, notification threshold. So the threshold would, be, would go from $8 million um, transactions to $10 million transactions, which is what I just um, mentioned. And also the um, proposed amendment would have a shorter notification period. Um, from uh, 60 days down to 30 days, which is uh, completely in line with the current federal law, um, the uh, uh, Hart Scott Rodino Act. Second, it's important to know that this bill primarily is, the goal of this bill is primarily to fill in a gap in federal antitrust enforcement. 
Many mergers are consummated in Maryland, which are not reviewed by federal agencies and are not reviewed by the Maryland antitrust authorities. And Marylanders lose when this happens. The bill does not expand the antitrust um, uh, uh, division's authority. It merely enables us to do more thoroughly um, and, and enforce more thoroughly our current authority. Third, the impetus of this bill um, is to protect Marylanders, uh, Maryland consumers, and Maryland markets. Many mergers um, that impact Marylanders and impact key uh, Maryland industries currently receive no antitrust scrutiny whatsoever. And some of those industries include the cannabis industry, include urgent care industries, local energy markets, et cetera. I'm going to just read you two headlines that I've been able to uh, come up, come across uh, just kind of doing uh, Maryland merger searches. And these are mergers that we had no information about. One is MedStar Health acquires Right Time Medical Care, which is a, a local um, uh, urgent care center in Maryland. Had no idea about this merger. Don't know if it was good or bad. We just don't have any information on it. And what's important about urgent care is that the, after the, um, the uh, uh, pandemic, um, urgent care um, visits have increased somewhere along the line of, of 70%. And this one is really important because the, the, can, the cannabis industry is very important to Maryland. Terrasin to, uh, to buy Allegheny Medical Marijuana Dispensary for, one, for $10 million in cash. This would not be reported to the um, federal authorities under the HSR. Terrasin will acquire 100% equity interest in AMMD for a total consideration of $10 million in cash. Our Maryland strategy is coming together nicely, says the chairman. When we enter the state, we plan to significantly sp expand our cultivation and manufacturing ca capacity in addition to vertically integrating. One year later, we have made significant progress with the build out of our 160,000 square foot facility and our acquisition of this high performing medical dispensary. And we don't know if this was good for Marylanders or not because we didn't get any information before the merger was consummated. And this is the opposite of the way it should be. The Attorney General's Office, the Antitrust Division should get information about mergers before they are consummated. And to be sure, the proposed merger notification is not onerous. It only requires the companies to identify three things 30 days before clo closing a deal that is valued at $10 million or more. Just identify the parties to the transaction, the assets that will be transferred, and the date that the parties are anticipating to close. With this information, the division can review the acquisition and determine if there are any competition concerns and then resolve them before the deal closes. And this notice um, merely just enables the division to more adequately carry out its law enforcement um, mission as it's currently um, devised. Pre-merger review is less costly for the parties and for the state. Post-acquisition investigations and potential litigation is expensive and would be a significant drain on the limited resources of the antitrust division and the companies themselves that are involved in these potentially problematic um, transactions. It's better to try to resolve any of these potential antitrust issues on the front end and not the back end. So with all that, we think that the bill represents a win-win for Maryland across the board, a win for Maryland citizens, a win for Maryland businesses, and a win for Maryland markets. Citizens get the benefit of competition because the state enforcer will actually examine mergers that could be anti-competitive and that no other antitrust enforcer currently reviews. Businesses get the confidence that their transactions do not raise concerns under the Maryland Antitrust Act. And markets are protected from undue concentration that can lead to negative impacts on price, output, and quality, et cetera. And this, we think, works to the benefit of all Marylanders. Um, that concludes my prepared statements, and I'm obviously able to answer questions to the extent you have them and will have. Are you have here just for, to answer questions, ma'am? 
Um, no, actually. Okay, I go was, ahead. Go ahead. I'm I was sorry. Going to add a little additionally. So I am. Uh, good afternoon, Vice Chair Crosby and members of the committee. My name is Heather Forsyth, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Health Education and Advocacy Unit at the Attorney General's Office. And I'm here to testify additionally in support of this bill because antitrust laws afford important consumer protections in healthcare markets. Um, healthcare market consolidation and, and cross market integration of hospitals and providers and insurers um, is increasing across the, across the country and in Maryland. Um, and I gave you a half a dozen or so resources in our written testimony, which I'll report that those sorts of consolidations um, contribute to rising health care costs, to lower quality of care, and provider dissatisfaction. And it's equally important to note that antitrust laws do not govern every merger or every acquisition or even every restraint of trade, right? Only those that are unreasonable, such as agreements that create monopolies or fix prices or divide markets or rig bids, right? So antitrust laws protect consumers by curbing potentially harmful mergers and promoting industry competition to drive innovation and to expand consumer choice. So cost control, quality of care, consumer choice, innovation, provider satisfaction, all things that we can recognize as desirable qualities for our healthcare market in Maryland. Marylanders deserve to have its regulators scrutinize consolidation that would adversely impact their quality and cost of care. Maryland patients would benefit from this pre-merger notification requirement, and thus we respectfully request a favorable report on House Bill 776. Thank you. Delegate Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So it says um, very clearly, and I'm just sort of digesting the bill now. Um, the jurisdiction of the court of the state. So who would be outside of that jurisdiction? So the jurisdiction of, so generally the way the division works, the yeah. way the antitrust laws work, I mean, it goes by the whatever companies would, we would be able to haul into court. Right. So you kind of think about the long arm statute. So if you're doing business in Maryland, you're um, a registered business in Maryland, you do a merger, then you would fall under the um, jurisdiction of the court. If they're registered in Delaware, they wouldn't. Well, if they're registered in Delaware and they're doing business in Maryland, right. they come under the long arm statute of the, okay. the Maryland um, laws, okay. then, then yeah, we would have jurisdiction over them on, under any circumstance. Okay, okay. And then um, it says the OAG may define any terms under the bill and adopt implementing regulations. And again, I know you just spoke for a few minutes, but real quickly, what are those ter what terms? I, which? I'm sorry, I'm on the fiscal <laughs> policy note. Portion the analysis of the bill, um, page at the bottom of page two. Okay, so that is referring to um, eleven two o five e. Okay. Right, and so that says that the attorney general may define terms used in this mm -hmm. section and exempt classes of acquisitions. So that is is taken really from the way the Hart Scott Rodino Act is um okay, okay. Is so that's works. a settled court well settled it hasn't been litigated uh, um, but settled legislation that yeah, yeah okay. exactly that's the way the the um, federal law works okay so and that's that's exactly what I was looking for was like kind of the spirit of, yes of what, yes what would be and then it talks about it you know what we'll talk offline but it, my, my question and concerns and don't is like as far as the voting and then the ten thousand dollar Fine. Is that per vote? Is that per voting percentage and stuff like that? But I, we can talk about this. I don't want to take up okay. all the time. I'll, you know? I'll give you my card and Please. you can, um, yeah, you can absolutely yeah. reach thank, out and to thank me you and for we can the discuss. bill. I appreciate it. Yep. Delegate Adams. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so when I, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when I think antitrust, I think uh, Microsoft buys Activision and Bethesda, which are software manuf or, uh, producer programmers and they, they kind of buy up the market, and it's antitrust because their competitors, Sony and Apple, would be like, well, you're buying all the uh, popular brands, and so you hear in the news, you can imagine like General Motors one day maybe saying, okay, we're going to buy uh, Ford. Uh, just th Those are stories that I think make front-page news because these are not $10 million 
transactions, which are small. I mean, these are huge uh, conversations of national importance that do speak to monopolies in a sense that I'm aware of it. Uh, so how do you compare and contrast those examples that I've shared against uh, like what you're actually trying to get after, because it feels like you're after something very particular, and I think you may have alluded to it with cannabis. But I'm just curious. Uh, I just can't imagine a Maryland example where $10 million rises to the level of Microsoft buying, um, you know, major national, uh, international, uh, you know, programmers. Uh, if, I hope I'm asking the question question correctly, because I'm just yeah. a layman. Uh, but when we talk about antitrust, that's a very serious uh, national conversation. It's like, yeah. It, it, it is a, a, a serious national conversation, but I will say this. The, the state antitrust laws came before the federal antitrust laws. So we okay. in the states kind of uh, started this thing in terms of uh, trust busting. So when you're talking about, say, Microsoft and just say Apple would never happen, but just That's say a good those example. two. <laughs> um, I, I would be curious and concerned about that, but go ahead. Right. So, and yeah. not only would you be concerned, but the feds would be concerned, right? So, the federal threshold is 122 million for the transaction, and is so really the, the federal, the federal antitrust laws cover big transactions and big parties, right? So you got pe companies that have you know hundreds of millions of dollars in um, overturn every year. So these are big companies. These, wouldn't, these companies would fall, the, the transactions that we would uh, focus on under HB 776 would be ones that fall below that threshold. So right now there's a gap. If there is a, a $50 million transaction that impacts, say, Baltimore City or impacts um, the Eastern Shore, there's a merger there, nobody's looking at that. We have jurisdiction to look at that, but we don't get notification. So what I may do is have my investigators, say, do a search and find that, oh, X amount of transactions, X amount of mergers have happened, but they're after the fact. So what I could do is, you know, corral resources to try to say, well, let's do an ex post facto examination and see if this is something that we would want to challenge. That's a waste of resources. So all we're asking is that parties before they merge come to us and just provide information about which, what the parties are, what the assets are, and when the closing date is. And we just ask that, um, just give us that information and we can look at it and see, we can make an assessment and see if it's something that we think is problematic, then we can reach out to the parties. We're not trying to litigate. Right. We're not looking for cases. We're just looking to protect Maryland markets and Maryland consumers. S second of three questions, this is an important bill. Um, the, the, the second question is, I can't think of one example, whether it's Salisbury, Maryland, like one municipality on the Eastern Shore, the Eastern Shore in general, um, the state of Maryland, I can't think of one example where an antitrust act would lead to a monopolistic behavior by market participants. So why don't we just take an example of the city of Salisbury, what $10 million uh, transaction would yield a decision by your department that says they are conducting uh, their business as a monopoly, which is what you're trying to protect us from. I, it, it, well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up to me. The number is too small. The, the transactions are not uh, large enough to have me think that the state of Maryland would be concerned with that size of transaction. It, it, does, it's not, it does not indicate to me the Microsoft-Apple conversation at all. Right, and we, the Microsoft Apple transactions will be looked at at a higher level. So we're concerned about local markets, and it's not just monopolies. So the, the section. Yeah, but that's why antitrust laws exist, is to protect this consumer from monopolistic transactions. I'm asking, what, so, give me an example of a, a, just a single municipality where two, a, a business transaction occurs that you would deem monopolistic. Are, are, are we talking about cannabis? Because uh, you, you brought it up, I'm trying I, to. I, I did bring it up, but there, there are a number. Okay, so this of, isn't targeting that. Uh, this is I, not targeting that. This okay. is not targeting well, uh, that. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking. And you're trying to answer. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, no, so, the, so just to be clear, the charge that we operate under in terms of merger review is if the effect of such acquisition may be substantially to lessen competition, substantially to lessen competition, or create a monopoly. 
So it's not just that these transactions would create a monopoly. So you could have a situation where, trans, where um, competition is reduced in a, in a small regional community. So what we do is we look at what's called the product market and we look at the geographic market. So that may be, and it all, it's all fact dependent. It all depends on the facts and circumstances. So I couldn't tell you, you know, this, this um, product has this geographic market, this other product has a different one. It really depends on the information that we get from the parties, and then we do an evaluation. Where are these, are these competitors? Where are they competing? Where, where are they drawing their, their customers from, et cetera? So we do a, an analysis of, that, analysis of that before we make a decision that we believe this is potentially anti-competitive. Last question. Uh, the current law is $100 million or $110 million? The federal law is $110 million. The That's what federal you law. How long has that been in place? So the feds adjust every year in January. So in the statute, you'll see, I think it says $50 million. The statute came into effect in 1978 or So in 1978, it was $50 million. And it gets adjusted every year. All right. So I would say that $100 million is not a lot of money if you own a lot of real estate and $10 million, I mean, I, I, I don't have to go very far to on the Eastern Shore to think about farmland, people that own 80 or 90 rental properties, some multifamily, one, maybe one multifamily property is worth more than $10 million. And, and, and so the question is, what is, because I think a lot of people will miss this, what happens when a innocent transaction occurs and it's $12 million, and they don't comply with the law, what's, what, what's the penalty for that, uh, that transgression? Could, could you go back uh, 60 days after the sale and say that sale's invalid? And, and So a couple things. So when you talk about, like, farmlands and real estate, et cetera, those things are typically going to be carved out of our jurisdiction. So either by... You said typically, so that doesn't mean it always is, but go ahead. Yeah, because it's all, it, it's very fact dependent. So a lot of the... What yeah, so the, the point is that a farm transaction still has to disclose, although you may not be interested in looking at it. Not, it, it's only going to disclose if the acquisition may substantially less competition or create a monopoly. So you'd have to, to define how a sale of a farm would impact competition. I mean, so, I know farmers on the Eastern Shore that own five, 6,000 acres of land and their family farms. I, somebody comes around and wants to put a uh, solar array, which seems to be coming. <laughs> That's a, I'm just saying, I don't think that this dollar amount, and, and, and Mr. Chair, thank you, I, I don't think this dollar amount even <laughs> comes close to being reasonable, which creates all the other questions I have. So I'll, I'll leave it there and, and thank you. I, I, and I would definitely be able to talk to you, be willing to talk to you offline. I can leave my cards, and people who are interested in doing such can feel free to reach out to me. Delegate Amprey. I, I have six questions. <laughs> joking, joking, joking. <laughs> Not trying to move downstairs. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm a transactional attorney. That's what I do during the day. I do a lot of mid-market, uh, trans middle market transactions that hit these numbers that you're talking about. And the, 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 t t I'm a little concerned here because when you're working, I've never worked in the, maybe one deal I've worked on in the, you know, several deals that I've been on where we've had a closing date that actually hit the closing date. And these closing dates matter a lot based on how your financing is going to occur. So my worry is with the enforcement of this, of this, of this bill, it would, it would really hinder and alter a lot of the middle market M&A transactions that happen, a lot of the real estate transactions that happen um, in a way in which it would really, I find it difficult to see how uh, transactions could occur smoothly. Uh, Maryland would be a place where transactions wouldn't want to occur. I, I'm just worried about that with, the, with, the, with, with, uh, with these closing date rules. So I want to hear more about that and what the, what the enforcement rules look like during a transaction. Because uh, transactions just the, the the numbers change, the the dates change mm -hmm. at, at this middle market stage. So I'm I'm trying to understand how that would work here, and again, and, and kind of to to piggyback off my colleague's question, like how are we defining competition? Uh, I think about um, in Baltimore, we I, I need as much development as possible in, in my district, 
And what I'm worried about here is, you know, how many transactions could be held up because someone finds it's not competitive, but we need that. We have so many vacants and areas that need, that need as quick as possible economic development. So I'm, I'm concerned a little bit there on um, the definition of competition and understanding how, what would that look like? If you can give me some examples at the real estate level, in a, you mentioned Baltimore, where would it look like where you would actually step in and stop a transaction? If you can give me an example of what that would look like. So I, I know it's a two-part question there, but I'm hoping okay. you can give me some, okay. some answers. I can, I can tell you this. Um, under the HSR, typically real, real estate transactions are carved out. Um, and we are really kind of connecting ourselves to the Hart Scott Rodino Act, the pre-merger notification. So that I think that would be the, the first question or the first answer is that I don't think ordinary course real estate transactions will fall under what we would be examining under the antitrust laws. Both because we, 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 we're trying to connect ourselves and be um, compatible with the HSR and there's a specific reg in the HSR that cuts out uh, real estate transactions. That's number one. Number two, the Attorney General himself in the, the, um, in the proposed um, uh, bill has the authority to um, exempt whole classes of transactions, persons, transfers, et cetera. So I think that would be the first thing, is that I don't think um, uh, ordinary course real estate transactions would be um, captured by this. In terms of what we look at in evaluating competition, typically it might be something like you have three um, providers or three competitors. We're typically looking at competitors, right? And we're looking at you have three competitors that um, are in the market for widgets. And two of those competitors are going to merge. So that's what we call a three to two. So then you kind of look at what are their um, market shares, and you do a, a certain evaluation to kind of see how that's going to impact competition, if that's going to impact competition. Right. And it's a, it's a kind of sausage-making process where you look at the shares, and then you square the shares, and you see what the delta of the change is. And if it reaches a certain level, then there's a presumption that it's anti-competitive. If it doesn't reach a certain level, then it's presumed not to be anti-competitive. So there's a, a whole lot that goes into looking at that. But as a general proposition, I've been doing this for um, upwards of 25 years. We've never um, had a situation where we looked at ordinary course real estate transactions in a merger review. Got it. And, and, and then just to go back to, to the first question, thank you, Chair. This is still part of my first question, I promise. <laughs> I, I, I just, I just want I just want to understand, again, in the, in the middle market mergers and acquisition space, you know, again, the, the dates change. So, so what happens if I give you all a date that, you know, we're going to close on April 30th, and things happen with all deals. Now it gets pushed back to August. But, like, what, what like, how, how does that work? Like, like, what does that look oh, like? Oh, you'd be golden if you went from April to August. I know, every, that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah because, so I, I mean, I, in terms of us, us, for us, we're saying, okay, give us 30 days before you close this transaction so that we can review it. If you're closing a transaction, you know, 80 days from then, then we do our review and ideally we say, okay, we don't have so any problems you with it. So that. you'd have to, but would I have to resubmit because no. the deal would change? If the no. Deal is, okay. okay. No, no. Oh, I'm, I'm good. You're Thank good? You. Thank you. I'm, I'm right. good for now. Yeah. Thank you, Delegate Adams. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ampry. Uh, we'll go to Delegate <laughs> Fisher. <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to clarify. The bill says $8 million. Is it? You said yes, you we amended made, it? Yes, we submitted a, um, an amendment. An okay. amendment, yes. And so the acquirer has to, has to have a value of $10 million or sales of $10 million, the, and then the acquired the has to also have? No, just the, the transaction is a, is a $10 million transaction. The acquiring, the, 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 the value of the merger or acquisition has to be $10 million. Yes, it's reportable at $10 million. So the Attorney General's Office of Maryland wants the veto power of a private transaction in the amount of $10 million? Well, I wouldn't call it. So here, here's the thing. That's I, a veto power of a private transaction. Well, we, we review. We, what we're asking for is information about the transaction. 
We currently are able to review mergers right now. So, I mean, to the extent that I've, there's I've been any involved in mergers many times in the cell tower space, and you've never been part of my business model. Ever. Right. So why has that not happened? If that's because we didn't know about it. But why should you, but why should you know about because it? Because it it's falls really under the Maryland Antitrust Act. If, so here's the thing. All these transactions currently fall under the Maryland Antitrust Act. We just don't know about them. And you don't know about them for a reason, because they're private transactions and they're none of your business. I mean, that's what I mean I, obviously, we have a disagreement about philosophy. Um, but what is the purpose of having a private sector if you get to have veto power over an acquisition? I mean, that's a federal matter when there's, you know, if, if, if Walmart decides to purchase three of the other largest retailers in the United States, I want the federal government involved in that. Believe me, I do, and I think that you would agree. But in the state of Maryland, $10 million transactions? I mean, I, I just, I, I'm just, I've heard you, and then you, then the, the definition is substantially less in competition. By definition, any acquisition of one company in the same space as another company in the same space is substantially lessening competition, by definition. Not, not necessarily, say if you, have 10, if you have 10 competitors. right? I mean, you can look at what the, what the feds do all the time, and you mm -hmm. can see what, what their um, mergers Thank and acquisitions. And I, I appreciate what you're saying, I, I definitely do. Um, but that's our charge, that's our, our statute, and that's what we, um, have jurisdiction over current. Delegate Howard. Appreciate it, Mr. Vice Chair. I never try to ask secondary questions, but as far, and I think this is important, and it ties into what the good delegate for Baltimore was asking about, because when you think of it in the context of homes and farms and, and things like that, I think it's important for the committee to hear this. As far as a re reporting requirement, is are you reporting up to the feds, and are the feds reporting acquisitions down? How is that? How no, is the, that the feds because I, I think much to, to if I can delegate and praise question is we would want to take a look at it if we were to even move forward on legislation like this, how this would positively or negative affect markets. And so is there a reporting requirement in the bill? What does that look like? And, there um, there is not a reporting requirement in the bill. The the feds look at mergers and acquisitions mm -hmm. that are above 111. Sure. We're, we're, we're in that space Do below they report them. that information when they, it happens they, in Maryland They do Town? not, and they so, cannot, okay. because it's, it's all confidential okay. under, the, um, under the HSR. Would we um, report that up to the feds? No, we would not. Or would we keep that information and provide a report to the legislature? That is a possibility. The legislature may want mm -hmm. to know, okay, what's going on in the merger space with the antitrust division? I mean, I could entirely envision that that could be something that is uh, requested. The um, feds do HSR reports, mm -hmm. I think, annually. I'd have to look at the statute and see when it is. But mm -hmm. they do reports on mergers and, and which ones. That's how we know right. that they've, they've got um, 3,000 um, HSR reports and they've uh, litigated 35 of them or 10% or, or okay. something like that. So there is some reporting that goes on in the federal level. That's not a part of the bill as we have um, proposed no it. There's no reporting. No. Okay. no. All right. Thank you. All right. I finally got to figure it out. Uh, Ma'am, question. The difference between 10 million and 8 million, how many more transactions is that in the grand scheme of things? capture we, we really don't know um, that okay. was a, a effort to try to um, uh, uh, cooperate with so you're just trying to work with it just trying to work unfavorable with the, okay the I mean it's seen, it depends on how you spend it right but like 125 percent or you know two million like 10 million <laughs> on some of these transactions probably doesn't seem like that many more you know transactions or mergers are captured in this is there any concern uh, from the office of the attorney general's office, and obviously you still have the bill, but you know this is going to capture a lot of mergers. And is there any concern to process these from within? See, we we really don't think that it will, um, primarily because there's so many areas that can be carved out under the um, attorney general's authority, which is very similar to the authority provided under the Hart Scott Rodino Act. Um, like I said, just kind of doing some poking around um, in my office, the attorneys in my office, um, have come across maybe 10, 20 
um, mergers that you know we thought we've seen that are at around the um, uh, ten million dollar level that we might have wanted to review, but that's kind of ex post facto, so we don't really know. But we don't anticipate that if we, um, the way that we have it, uh, the idea that we have in terms of structure, we don't anticipate that we'll receive um, an overwhelming number okay. of. Okay. Um, and then I guess my last question is there any concern, and there's opposition testimony to this, that Maryland is going to basically put itself at the forefront or impose itself on, I guess, what would be classified as typical national matters uh, as imposing their court system to oversee matters of national transactions. And I'll give you an example. Kroger is about to purchase Albertsons, right? Yes. Albertsons, a subsidiary of them, is Safeway. Safeway operates here in Maryland. I don't know if this gets challenged. I don't know which court it would go to, but it assume, you know, I would make the assumption that if this bill were to pass, Maryland would then take the lead on almost every transaction that is similar to that. Um. So, so here, here's the thing. Um, Maryland by itself would never challenge the Kroger Albertson deal. So, we currently have the jurisdiction to um, challenge mergers and acquisitions as they are. Now, the focus of the Maryland Antitrust Act are those deals that impact Maryland markets, and that's where our focus is. If you have a national deal, and we've been involved with national merger challenges, say with the Federal Trade Commission, because sometimes we do that. If there's a national merger that has a Maryland impact, we have gotten involved with those mergers with the federal agencies. We're looking at mergers that the federal agencies do not, um, do not have um, either resources to get involved in or do not have a, a, a Maryland-based focus. Well, how would you, cor I mean, I assume you talk to the FTC. Is that how you would coordinate that? Absolutely, absolutely. We do we do that on a regular basis. We coordinate um, merger so, review. Um, so would another way to do this, I mean, if you're worried about it, is have the FTC notify you of any case in Maryland that they don't want to take? They can. They, if it's a they, they, the Hart Scott Rodino Act has a confidentiality piece to it, and they cannot okay. share information that's, okay. so that's been provided okay. through the Hart Scott Rodino Act. Got you. And therefore, them. you're blind on it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, seeing no further questions, that concludes this panel. We will now go to the unfavorable. Uh, Scott Wilson, uh, Robert Enton, who I'm not sure has ever been more excited to testify unfavorably, uh, and Bill Costelli. Bob, you weren't even sitting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Robert Enton, I'm testifying uh, today on behalf of the Maryland Building Industry Association. Um, I'm not sure how to sign up for multiple clients when you sign up, but I don't have a single business uh, group that I represent that doesn't have concerns with the legislation. Um, you have, uh, uh, if you printed it all out, you have a pretty thick packet, I believe, of letters a written testimony in opposition to this bill from a variety of different Maryland businesses. I just want to make a couple things clear. Um, you know, the Attorney General under the current law, when if you go to page four of the bill, you will see that once they find out about a transaction, whether the transaction might have closed six months ago, a year ago, they have all the power enumerated on page four of the bill to institute proceedings in equity to prevent or restrain violations, uh, determine whether a violation's been committed, enter a judgment, remove the effects of any violation it finds, uh, prevent continuation or renewal of the violation, may exercise all equitable powers. Um, what this bill does, it has nothing to do with what the Attorney General is going to enforce or not enforce. What the bill says is for almost every business, whether it's local, the, the grocery store at the end of the block in your district, or whether it's a farm, whatever it is, it's not about what they're going to do after they get the information. It's about the fact that now, prior to going to settlement, your, your, your constituents, your businesses, your farmers, whoever it is, are all going to have to file this report. The only example that was given by the uh, proponents of the bill was the purchase of an urgent care center 
and the purchase of I forget what the what the, what the other one was urgent care center um, and, a, and, and a cannabis dispensary. That's, not, that's hard antitrust reasons. I'll close, Mr. Chairman, by just saying the federal limit is at $111 million. We're now going to be at $10 million. And there are almost no transactions of any business of any size in today's world Sir, please wrap that up. are going to be at that limit. So for, for all those reasons, we're, we're opposed to the bill. I'm happy to answer any questions. I know there's other opposition. Thank you. Go ahead. Bill, other gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, Bill Castelli, and I am here today on behalf of Brown Advisory and JMI Equity, two of our clients. They are both Maryland-based businesses, and they do have a lot of concerns about this legislation as well. Uh, it's been mentioned that the federal trigger for these reviews and the pre-merger notifications is $111 million. Um, and just to give you an example, that number has gone up. It used to be $50 million, and the reason it keeps going up is because the federal government is trying very hard to block out transactions that really don't have anti-competitive effects. So smaller transactions, they don't want to uh, spend their time reviewing those. So with a company like JMI Equity, they're a private equity company. They invest in a lot of uh, software technology companies. Um, uh, if they were to, uh, because we heard closing dates matter, they would be at a competitive disadvantage with every other private equity company investing in those software companies. So if you're a software company and you're taking a look and you've got an, another 30-day wait that you would have to um, um, abide by for a Maryland-based company as opposed to an equity company in another state, or you, you're putting JMI equity at a competitive disadvantage. And because you're doing that, the investors that JMI Equity would seek to actually make their investments and improve these companies, which is what they do, um, they would be at a competitive disadvantage trying to attract those folks. So I think this number, $111 million down to $10 million, really um, it, it brings, captures so many unintended transactions, which maybe under the authority in the bill would, would be considered ordinary course. And I guess that's one of the, the, the things this committee can talk about, but we don't know what that will be. And for the, all of those reasons, we, we are opposed to this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, members of the committee, my name is Scott Wilson. I'm the uh, head of the corporate uh, and securities practice at a law firm um, in Baltimore, Miles and Stockbridge. I'm here on behalf of the Committee on Corporation Laws of the Business Law Section of the Maryland State Bar Association. Uh, we've submitted written testimony in opposition and uh, agree with our, our colleagues up here in opposition. I won't uh, duplicate any of that. I'll just make a couple further points. Um, this bill, if enacted, would be the first of its kind in the country, a state-level pre-merger, pre-transaction notification requirement, the very first of its kind, that general in nature. There are two states that touch healthcare transactions. Um, further, it's not that it's not the, even the amount at issue. It is the fact that Maryland becomes an outlier. If you made the amount one hundred and eleven point four million dollars, which is the federal threshold, Maryland would still be an outlier, um, and we would put Maryland businesses and individuals at a competitive disadvantage in exactly the way um, that was articulated on behalf of JMI Equity. Moreover, uh, at the amount we're talking about, there were 7,002 pre-merger notifications for 3,520 transactions in 2021 at, 100, at, 100, at 92 to $101 million. At $10 million, we're talking tens, if not hundreds of thousands of transactions, um, putting Maryland squarely as an outlier and a pariah in the business community, not only locally, but nationally. Um, for all of those reasons, happy to answer any questions, but uh, the Corporation, Committee on Corporation Laws uh, seeks an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think uh, my first question is kind of already answered by Mr. Wilson and when you said we will be the first state in the nation to, to do this. Are you talking about the fact that the state is even involved in such matters? Uh, or are you saying you have problem with the threshold? Um, 
And, and when you say no other states have such laws, are you talking about which one of these two issues? It's the, it's, it's the involvement at the state level. I think the issue articulated by the Attorney General is a national issue that should be addressed at the federal level. The Attorney General co-signed a, a, a letter in response to a request from comments from the FTC and the DOJ on April 21st, 2022. One of their suggestions was to involve the state AGs uh, at, the, at the front end of mer federal merger review. And that's a, a logical request and a logical next step. It's not to create a Maryland-specific pre-merger notification process. It's not the threshold from my perspective. Thank you. Would, sir, would you be okay if it mirrored the federal law? Would that be okay or no? So for context on how difficult that would be to do, the Attorney General, that letter that the Attorney General co-signed just last year was 100 pages long in comments on the regulations. So it's, it's, there's 40 years of case law developing and, you know, there's, you know, a book of regulations. So it would be virtually impossible to do, and the concern in the business community and, and for the clients of the Committee on Corporation Laws would be, you have a separate filing now, what are the gaps between the two? And it's that inherent uncertainty that would put Marylanders at a competitive disadvantage. Why subject yourself to that process when you can get the same bag of money the next state over? Gotcha. Okay. Appreciate it. Seeing no further questions, that concludes this bill hearing. Next, we'll go to House Bill 777. Uh, again, the Attorney General uh, is here, um, and we have Anna McCormack. Go ahead and start when ready, ma'am. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Crosby and uh, the other members of this committee. I want to thank you for your patience today. I know it's been a long afternoon, so I will try and keep this very short. My name is Anna McCormack. I'm an assistant attorney general in the Tobacco Enforcement Unit of the Attorney General's Office. The unit enforces Maryland's rights and obligations under the Master Settlement Agreement, which is a landmark public health agreement. Through the MSA, Maryland receives approximately $140 million from Big Tobacco every year. And if Maryland can demonstrate that it would diligently enforce its escrow act, it will receive approximately $20 million more each year. If, on the other hand, Maryland is found not diligent, it can stand to lose some or all of this payment. A crucial part of enforcing the Escrow Act is tracking the number of cigarettes sold by manufacturer and brand. This is because tobacco manufacturers that have not joined the MSA do not make these annual payments, but instead deposit a set amount for every tax-paid stamped cigarette sold in the state. HB 777 would help Maryland enforce the Escrow Act and save the agencies that handle this a lot of time and hassle. The bill would fix a gap in the state's oversight and enforcement by making it a violation of the law to submit information that is not complete and accurate. Right now, it is not a violation for the wholesalers to give wrong or incomplete information, <clears throat> pardon me, on the form that they submit this on. HB 777 would <clears throat> fix that. It does not change the amount of taxes that a wholesaler pays it only requires that the wholesalers provide correct information to the state. The bill also gives the AG's office penalty authority. A penalty could be levied against a wholesaler after that wholesaler was found to have violated this provision of the law by submitting erroneous, incomplete information. Although this bill is a small change, it would help the state's oversight of its licensees and strengthen Maryland's diligent efforts to help secure all of the monies due to the state from Big Tobacco. For that reason, we urge a favorable report on House Bill 777, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, okay, ma'am. Seeing you. no questions, uh, that concludes this panel. We'll now go to unfavorable, Mr. Bariano. I'd like a glass of water, please. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, Bruce Barriano. I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Tobacco Wholesalers in very strong opposition to this bill. Um, uh, the Maryland Wholesalers, I'll be very quick because you've only given me two minutes. The Maryland Wholesalers buy stamps from the Comptroller's Office and they, they, they actually work as agents for the state, uh, stamping all the cigarettes that are sold 
uh, uh, in the state of Maryland, and they pay that money up front uh, to the state of Maryland. Uh, this bill uh, really bothers me. I'm not, I'm not going to get overly emotional on it. First of all, it assumes that my clients, most of them are a lot of uh, small family uh, businesses, a couple of them in, in, in uh, Montgomery County. They, they, they stamp their tobacco wholesalers. Um, uh, it assumes that they're bad people, that they are not uh, providing complete and accurate information uh, already. I don't know of any instance that the Attorney General's office has reached out to my clients and had a meeting first to discuss this before putting in this bill, which has a draconian piece to it. And if the Attorney General, uh, in their opinion, thinks it is not complete and accurate, without any due process whatsoever, if you turn to page two of the bill, on line 20, uh, they can levy if, in their opinion, they think they're not being upfront and legitimate and kosher, uh, then they can uh, uh, say that they violated it and uh, issue a violation uh, to them and a very hefty penalty without any due process. Without, there's nothing in here of due process. My clients work for the state of Maryland in collecting and stamping the taxes for you all, and I think they deserve some fair treatment. Uh, what the Attorney General's office should have done is called my clients in. There are not a lot of them anymore and had a meeting. And if there are problems with accurate information, let's talk about it. But this bill comes out as a surprise, and it's grossly unfair. I would urge an unfair report. I would ask the Attorney General's office to uh, gather the, the licensed wholesalers and talk it over. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I encourage the Office of Attorney General's Office, Attorney General office to sit down with you uh, and see if you can come to some sort of a resolution. Seeing no questions, uh, that concludes this Thank bill hearing. Thank you very much. Um, and so now we will go to the final bill of the day, House Bill 913, Delegate Lopez. Thank you all for waiting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, ECM members. For the record, my name is Delegate Leslie Lopez, and I'm here to ask for your favorable support for HB 913, which is a simple reporting bill that requires student loan companies acting in Maryland to register with the Commissioner of Financial Regulation and then provide annual reports about their practices. These reports will give Maryland important data that helps us understand the landscape of private student loans owned by our residents and identify both the good student loan companies following our laws and those that are violating them and causing financial harm to Marylanders. Uh, this bill builds upon the great work that this committee passed uh, last session to rein in student loan debt predatory practices. Uh, most student loan debt is federal. Uh, but private student loan debt is largely unregulated. In fact, we don't even know, we've kind of a loose estimate of the breakdown. We think in our state about 90% of student loan debt is federal and there's great protections, but it's this other kind of ambiguous 10% that's very troublesome. Uh, and it's troublesome because it's a last resort for many people. Uh, people who are lower income and vulnerable and have maxed out all their other options will take out private student loans. Um, and also because the interest rates are based on credit scores and not uh, merit or need. Student loan debt is considered by many to be a generational issue for millennials and Gen Z, uh, but that's really not the case. Our, our senior citizens are significantly impacted by private student loan debt in particular. According to the AARP, about 25% of student loan borrowers who are over 50 are paying on private student loans, and that's because they have to be co-signers for their children and grandchildren. Uh, there, are, there are many technical amendments uh, to this bill, and that represents the consensus building that we've been doing over the interim. Um, you'll even find uh, a letter of support from the Department of Labor, which would be in charge of data collection. Other states have gone this route already, Louisiana, Maine, and Colorado, and I would point to Colorado as being the leading case study for uh, how to set this system up um, and also how to use the data in a very positive way. 
Um, I'll have Winston Berkman Bream here from Student Borrowers Protection Center to explain all these technical amendments. Um, and so, just in closing, I ask for your favorable support and I thank you for your support on previous legislation. Uh, and just note that this bill does nothing to change business practices. It simply just asks for, for data and a registry. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Delegate. Thank you, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Winston Berkman Breen. I'm the Policy Counsel for the Student Borrower Protection Center, or a national policy nonprofit focused on the student debt crisis. Before joining the SPPC, I was a state financial regulator in New York and was the student loan ombudsperson for that state. Uh, I'm testifying in support of HB 913. Essentially, this bill, what it does is ensure that the state's financial regulator and policymakers know what entities are making private student loans in the state by requiring these companies to file annual reports. Not all lenders are required to be licensed in Maryland, and even those that are are not required to provide student loan-specific data. Even the Federal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has admitted it does not know much about uh, specifics about the private student loan market. So that should be concern concerning because the private student loan market is likely $4 billion in Maryland. Um, it's also concerning because the shadiest lenders partner with for-profit schools that offer high, pro uh, high cost, low quality educations and leave students in debt, particularly in communities of color. This isn't unique to Maryland, it's true all over the country. As the delegate mentioned, some states are starting to pass laws like this to address this problem. So what this bill would cover are both those entities that make loans, lenders, and those that acquire these private student loans, even if they're not themselves a lender. It requires them to report basic information on their portfolios and borrower outcomes for Maryland borrowers. Um, there might be some opposition to this bill that says that it's not needed or that it might be onerous or that there are preemption concerns. Um, I would say that it is needed for all the reasons we've discussed. The state has a blind spot. Um, it's not onerous because we've seen other states uh, already implement this and these are sophisticated financial companies. And the bill is drafted very specifically to address any potential preemption issues uh, with respect to the covered lenders. Uh, as the delegate said, there are some um, amendments. I'm happy to discuss them in detail. They do two things. They clarify the bill's reporting structure and apply lessons learned from the other states, and they incorporate the Commissioner of Financial Regulation's particular edits into the proposed bill. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Delegate Lopez, for introducing this bill. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. And seeing no questions, that concludes this bill hearing as well as the bill hearings for today. I appreciate all the members hanging in there. Uh, thank you and have a great day.